First, I need to apologize to you viewers. I'm so sorry. I'm coming to you in my time of need. Please help me. Please listen to this to the end. That's it. That's all I ask. I don't know what to do or where to turn. Please help me. That's all I ask. My name is Danny, and I'm a single father. I don't tell you this like it's some badge of honour, and I'm expecting cookies, milk and chocolate covered snowflakes like most others in my social circle would. They want your pats on the back and recognition. I just want some of your time. I see fatherhood as a burden. Necessary, yes, but still a burden. My son's name is Jesse. He's 11. That's 5th grade for you math haters. Jesse started the 5th grade this year like any other kid would. There was a little bit of trepidation and lots of excitement. He was a happy-go-lucky sort of kid, full of life and energy. All that changed after he met Stan on Tuesday. Stan was a late addition to Jesse's class, a transfer student from another district. Jesse's teacher sat Stan next to Jesse. When I picked Jesse up after school on Tuesday, he told me that Stan was his new best friend. He wasn't acting like himself though. He was pale and sweaty. I took his temperature, but he wasn't running a fever. I asked about his day, and all he would tell me was that Stan was his new best friend. Stan's my new best friend, Jesse would say. I know, I can't wait to meet him, I'd say back. Dad, Stan is great, you should meet him, he's my new best friend, the best in the world. We must have had this same conversation a thousand times that night. When I took Jesse in bed, he looked up at me with tears in his eyes. He put his little hand in front of his face and wiggled his index finger, telling me to come closer. I bent over him, and he put his hand to either side of his mouth. You know, the little kid way of telling a secret. Well, I turned my head, and he whispered something into my ear that chilled me. At the time, I didn't know why it chilled me, but it did. He whispered, you do believe me, right, Dad? I sat back up and looked down at him. Believe you about what, son? Stan, he said. Stan's my best friend. I nodded and took his temperature once more. Again, he wasn't running a fever. I went to bed but couldn't really sleep that night. On Wednesday, I pulled up to the school to drop Jesse off. He got this really weird look on his face and told me that he didn't want to go in. Are you feeling sick? I asked. No, he said. He was chewing on his bottom lip like crazy. This was something else I'd never seen him do. No, I need to go to school. He opened the car door and got out. No goodbye, no I love you, nothing. He trudged up the front steps of the school with his head down. I let off the brake and turned away to drive to work. A little boy was standing right in front of my car. Two more seconds and I would have run him over. The boy was pale with a mop of blonde hair that was almost white and bright blue eyes. He knocked on the hood of my car twice, waved once, and walked up the stairs to school. When I picked Jesse up after school on Wednesday, he looked a lot better. He was a tiny bit paler than normal, but he seemed happy. He told me all about his day, he told me about dinosaurs and music and math, and then he told me about recess. 
And then, after math period, we had recess. Dad, you'll never guess what I did today at recess. Tell me, I said, smiling to myself as I'm driving. I'm thinking tag, football, keep away. All the things I remember the boys doing at recess when I was that age. Something benign. Something normal. I joined a church. I frowned at this. A church? At recess? Jesse nodded. The church of Stan. I thought that it must be some sort of new make-believe game the kids were playing. What's the church of Stan? I asked. It's Stan's church, Dad. Jesse laughed like I was the silliest person in the world for asking that question. What do you guys do, though? You know, as members? I asked. Lots of stuff. Today, though, we just listened to Stan talk. He was saying some funny words and I got sleepy and dozed off. A bunch of us did. I pulled into the driveway at home and we got out. Was that it? I asked. Things sounded weird for sure, but the kids didn't seem to be doing anything wrong. Stan gave us flyers too. Jesse pulled out a crinkled up piece of paper and handed it to me. It was a piece of manila paper with three words written in black marker. Church of Stan. Again, weird, but nothing wrong. I just thought the boys were playing make-belief. I was wrong. When I picked Jesse up after school yesterday, I could tell that something was very wrong with my little boy. He looked panicked and scared. What's going on, son? I asked, reaching out to feel his forehead. No fever. We played the soul game today, he said. Jesse's head was on a swivel. He couldn't sit still. He kept looking all around as we headed home. The soul game? I asked. Jesse just nodded and kept trying to look everywhere at once. Beads of sweat dotted his upper lip. What's the soul game? I asked. Jesse shook his head no and said nothing. Jesse, what's the soul game? I asked. I told him I didn't want to, but he said he wouldn't be my friend anymore if I didn't play. Who wouldn't be your friend? Where were the teachers? Jesse started breathing harder, but still answered. It happened in the church, he said. Then he whispered, Teachers aren't allowed in the church. The church of Stan? I asked. Jesse nodded, and a tear slipped down his cheek. What's the soul game, Jesse? I'm your father. You tell me right now, and I'll take care of everything. I said. I can't tell you, Dad. I can't. The rules are bad. They're so bad. What about Stan? I asked. Will Stan tell me the rules? No! Jesse screamed this and scared me half to death. Don't ask him the rules! Please don't, Dad! Please! I pulled into the driveway, scared and confused. Promise me, Dad! Promise me, promise me, promise me, promise me, please! Jesse was bawling now, terrified. I took him into my arms and rocked him. I hadn't rocked him like that since he'd been in kindergarten. He fell asleep in my arms and I carried him inside. I took him straight to his room and got him ready for bed. He just needs sleep, I kept telling myself. All he needs is sleep. I put him to bed and ate dinner alone. I checked up on him around nine when I went to bed. He seemed to be sleeping well, so I decided to go to sleep. 
I woke up to him screaming at the top of his lungs 18 minutes after midnight last night. I ran to his room, but he wasn't in his bed. I turned on the light and Jesse came flying out of the closet like something was chasing him. He latched onto my leg and kept screaming. I tried to calm him down and ask what was wrong at the same time. It wasn't making any sense. He just kept screaming about the soul game. He was impossible. I kept asking what that was, but he wouldn't tell me. I tried to put him back to bed, but he would have none of it. Finally, I just took him to my room and he slept in my bed. Jesse fell right to sleep. I was lying on my side, watching him, stroking his hair, when his eyes popped open and he stared right into mine. I'll tell you the rules after school tomorrow, he said. Then he closed his eyes. What was going on with my kid? In the darkness, I stared at the ceiling for a long time before rolling over to my side and staring into the bathroom. You know how when you're at the edge of sleep, sometimes your leg will kick and jerk you awake, or you'll imagine yourself falling or that you've tripped over something and get jerked awake. That happened to me all last night, only I kept being ripped from sleep by seeing something in the doorway to the bathroom. Every time my eyes would start to slip shut, I'd see the dark outline of something large in the doorway and jerk awake. Of course, nothing would be there and I would start falling asleep again. The outline would appear in the doorway once more, but it would be closer to me, like it had taken a baby step. Over and over, this kept happening until morning. This morning, on the way to school, Jesse seemed out of it, lethargic. I felt the same way. I was even more exhausted. I thought of asking Jesse about what he'd said right before he fell asleep, but couldn't. I was afraid it would send him into hysterics again, so I left it alone. I drove him to school, and he didn't say a word the whole time. He was acting like a robot, listless, unemotional. I got a call shortly after dropping him off to come pick him back up. He'd vomited in class. When I picked him up, he was the same. I asked him several questions, but he only gave me grunts in response. The plan at home was to get him changed out of his dirty clothes then take him to the doctor. He didn't say anything until we pulled into the driveway. Can Stan come over today? He asked. He stared out of the windshield at the garage door. You're not feeling well, son. Do you really want him to come over? I asked. I wanted to meet this kid, but it didn't sound like Jesse wanted him over. I, however, wanted to get to the bottom of this. Yes, Jesse said. Okay, I said. Do you have his parents' number? He already asked his parents, and they said it was okay. We have to wait until he's out of class, and I'd still like to talk to his parents. Okay. Jesse got out of the car, and we walked into the house. You have the number? I asked as I shut the door. No, he said. I started to ask him how I was supposed to call them if I didn't have their number, but someone knocked on the door. I was still standing right next to it. I opened the door, and standing on my front step was the pale little boy with blue eyes and a mop of white blonde hair that I'd almost run over on Wednesday. 
a little girl stood next to him with the same complexion. Yes? I asked. Hi, Dee, the little boy said. Is Jesse home? The little boy standing on my front porch shouldn't have known that name. It was my nickname from college, created on a drunken night amongst my friends, shortened from Danny. No, I said. That's fine, the little girl said. My name is Devin, and you already know my brother's name. Stan, I said. The little girl covered her mouth and giggled. Stan smiled and shrugged. It's really quite simple. Rule 1. Don't walk past mirrors in the dark. Rule 2. Don't leave any doors open when you go to bed tonight. Ask your son what rule 3 is, and remember, the creak means you're falling behind, a rustle means you've almost lost. When the lights go down, hopefully you won't see the dark shadow standing in the corner of the room. Hopefully you won't hear it breathing as your eyes shut and you begin to drift off. And if you hear a bang, well, hopefully you never hear a bang. Stan turned and walked away with his sister. I stared after them both and shook my head. I wouldn't play their stupid game. I walked into the house and found Jesse sitting at the kitchen table, crying. What's wrong? I asked. I heard a bang, he whispered. My mouth went dry. When does the game end? I asked. It doesn't, he whispered. It never ends. My heart started beating faster. What's the third rule, Jesse? His face fell, and he sucked in a deep breath. Rule three. Knowing all three rules makes you a player. My stomach dropped. What happens if you lose? When it's dark, you'll hear them coming. They like to let you know when they're getting close. Who? Stan and Devin, Jesse said. They'll reach out through the mirrors or open doorways and drag you through. How do you win? I asked. You win if you tell more people the rules to the soul game than the person that told you does. Like I said, viewers, I am so sorry. But thanks for helping, really. I'm going to enjoy my newfound freedom, and I hope that you enjoy your night. Give Stan and Devon my best. When I was young, it was every kid's dream to go to Disneyland. The advertisements raged on constantly between Saturday morning cartoons and the summer holidays were coming up, so you know every kid was asking their parents to take them, and you know I was one of them. My parents always kept quiet about it, never giving a straight answer. I was close to giving up on the dream of going to the Magic Kingdom until they pulled me aside before the end of the school term. Adam, they said, we've been hearing great things from your teachers this year, and your grades have improved so much. We're very proud of you. So we saved some money aside, and we're taking you to Disneyland. How should a kid react? Thank their parents politely and profusely? Express their love joyously? Well, being eight, and having a low emotional constitution, I simply broke down and cried. It was the happiest moment ever that I can remember, and will probably never be topped. 
How can you ever top such wholehearted, innocent childhood glee? The time just slipped by until we were on the plane to Paris. Life was a happy blur until the vivid memory of the magnificent entrance to the park. It was everything any kid could wish for. I tried my best to do everything. Honestly, the energy kids have is astounding. Looking back, my parents must have been heavily exhausted trying to keep up, yet they never faltered knowing it was bringing me lasting joy. And for that, I am grateful. However, it had cost them a pretty penny for the whole trip, and one memory stands out to me, which is the reason why I'm telling you this. We were at the gift shop, and they were picking up various merchandise and suggesting we buy it as a souvenir. Everything they picked up was simple little trinkets, little keychains, fridge magnets, and other little pieces. I wasn't having any of it. It wasn't enough to encapsulate my feelings for the trip. I kept going back to an intricate glass figurine of a beautiful Disney character. I can't even say which one, because it's been so long, and there's a more detailed part of this story that is more ingrained in my memory. The figure cost around 120 euros, which was a lot for the time, way too much for my parents. They obviously said no every time, and this next part saddens me. I became irate. Yeah, I was one of those kids, kicking and screaming and pointing at the thing I wanted, being very loud and obnoxious. I still remember the embarrassed look on their face. We left without buying anything, and I was left with no souvenir, or so they thought. What they didn't know is later that day, I went back in the shop. I was eight, so I was small enough to duck behind shelves without looking too suspicious. I reached over to the figurine and hid it in my Mickey Mouse hat. I looked over to the shopkeeper. He was busy with a customer. The other customers didn't notice. I thought I got away with it until I noticed far out of the door there was a mascot facing my direction. At first, I thought he saw me, but in my mind, I figured he couldn't have. I reasoned that the visibility in those things were terrible, and that he was probably just facing the store because he was trying to attract new customers in, and thanking customers who left. When I walked past, he simply turned his head as I made my way back to my parents. He made no attempts to confront me. Past then, my memory fades. I simply went back to being a kid in school, sharing memories with the other kids who'd managed to go for the holidays, and scoffing at the kids who never managed to go. It's an amusing concept looking back, but it created an almost serious dichotomy back in the day. It wasn't until a few weeks later that I started seeing some weird things happen. It was small at first. I would be playing in the schoolyard, and from behind a tree far off in the distance, I would see what I thought was a thin black arm with a novelty-sized white glove slip behind it. A strange sight to see. However, there were white pigeons in the area, and it was dark in that part of the woods, so it was easy to explain away. And this continued from then on. Each time, I would rationalize it in my mind. However, it didn't take long until it was getting harder to do so. Sometimes, I would see the top of two black domes hiding behind a wall, before slipping down out of sight. I would peek over to see what it was, and see nothing, with nowhere anything could hide. I tried being faster. However, I could never catch a full glimpse of the thing. There was one thing I could piece together though, based on all the parts I'd seen hiding. It was definitely a Mickey Mouse mascot. The one instance that really scared me, so much so I started screaming, was at night when I was tucked in bed. I turned my head nonchalantly, and through my window 
I could see the iconic Mickey Mouse ears and the top half of its eyes. This was the most I'd ever seen of its face and I instantly panicked. I did everything under a kid's arsenal to get help. I ran around, I screamed, I cried, I made as much noise as possible. In record time, my parents ran in and tried to calm me down. They kept asking what happened, and all I could do was point to the window and garble out a mess of sounds. We all turned to the window and saw nothing. From then on, I was actively scared of anything Disney. Other kids would have their Disney toys, and I would shy away. They would bring up the Disney movie they saw the night before, and I would try to turn the conversation to another topic. I got rid of anything I had that was remotely Disney. Anything to ease my mind and erase the trauma I had experienced. It never worked, but it helped. After that, things calmed down. I feel I would be close to seeing something disturbing, but it would be out of sight as soon as my eyes focused. Still though, it never eased the paranoia, something that haunted my everyday. I felt I was getting close to forgetting all this, and living with a residing feeling after that traumatic evening until in high school, when my best friend's birthday was coming up. Disney was still a popular topic, despite us having grown up since the hype. He decided to organize a Disney trip and bring two friends. One of those kids that had parents who could afford to do such grand gesture. I tried to deny the invitation, but he was my best friend and wouldn't take no for an answer. I tried getting my parents to pull me out, but they thought I was just nervous about the flight. So... It wasn't long until I was boarding a flight to my literal nightmare. The group consisted of my best friend, one of his friends, his parents, and me. As soon as we settled in, we were off to have our grand adventure. It didn't take long until we split up to do our own things for a bit, with a time and place to meet up afterwards. I strolled around the park, trying to mind my own business and avoid the mascots. It hadn't been so long that I was ready to let my guard down in front of them, despite the friendly setting. It was odd, but every time I walked past the mascot, I swear they would briefly drop what they were doing, whether they were promoting merchandise or talking to a kid, and just stare at me as I passed. They just turned their heads slowly, their novelty-sized eyes glaring at me cold and dead. At night, I tried to feel safe. I locked my door, tucked under my blanket, and tried to sleep the night away. However, I couldn't. The light seeping in through the open curtain perturbed me, and briefly reminded me of that night so long ago. I figured it couldn't happen again if I fully shut my curtain, so I went over to do so. As I grabbed each side to draw them shut, I noticed something in the distance. Standing in the middle of the grounds, completely in the open, was a mascot. It was Mickey, just standing there. If it wasn't so far away, I could have sworn it was looking at my window. I stared for a bit. It was just glaring, unmoving, disturbing. My heart started to race. I was scared to look away, but eventually I developed a resolve and pulled the curtain shut as hard as I could. I raced to my bed and wrapped myself so tight that any childish fear couldn't penetrate, and I slept to the gentle sound of something soft brushing my window, and what I fear now was heavy breathing. In the morning, I woke up exhausted. My friends, on the other hand, were sprightly awake and ready for a day of action. Obviously, I tried bringing up the night before, but you can never fully convey anything as simple as a mascot standing, unmoving in a theme park, without getting the simple answers. It was probably just an empty costume left out. 
It was probably a mascot on break. I was probably just dreaming it. Seems it's easy to believe the simple solutions than to humour the terrifying one. I stayed alert for the rest of the trip, pretending to enjoy the place around my friends and the parents, and keeping a low profile while alone. It felt like an eternity, but I made it home in one piece. I want to say things calmed down from here, but they didn't. It got worse. The mascot that haunted my childhood seemingly stopped bothering to hide. I would catch it just standing out in the open, taunting me with its presence. When my parents drove me to school, I would catch glimpses of Mickey facing the direction of the car between alleys. While out shopping, it'd be standing behind a moving crowd, slowly holding out its hand, before fading away behind the hustle. I distinctly remember one instance in my mum's office building. It was some learning experience week at school, and I decided to work as a runner in my mum's office for a week. The elevators there had those narrow portal windows to view each floor as you passed. While in a group, they functioned exactly as intended. However, in the brief instance I was alone, I saw snapshots of Mickey flash by each floor. I freaked out at this, terrified for my life, dreading the time in which the elevator would stop. The worst was at night. If I forgot to close my curtains, I would just see that horrifically sized head just staring at me through the window. I couldn't call someone, why bother, it'd just slip away as soon as they came. Trying to take a picture ended in the same result. A running motif over time was his hand. I would sometimes see him either raising it, palm side up, or it would already be held out, almost as if it wanted something. It didn't take me long to think of a solution. The figurine. I frantically rummaged through my old childhood items, toys, books and the like. Nothing Disney. Of course, I got rid of everything as a child when I was terrified for my life. I no doubt had gotten rid of the figurine. I was mortified at this thought. My next idea was a simple one. While at the school library, I googled the exchange rate of the euro for the year I went to Disney and scraped up my pocket money. I had the right amount, so I did something any other kid would think is crazy. I left it out on my doorstep. I know that anyone could take it, but if it was gone in the morning, I'd at least have some hope it would appease this nightmare. I left the notes on the doorstep, under a note apologising for what I did. I placed a small rock on it to keep it from blowing away, and I went to bed. That night, I did something that terrified me as a kid. I slept with the curtains open. I wanted to wait until it was night, and see if that horrific icon would be staring at me. I woke up in the dark hours of the morning. I took a few deep breaths for courage, closed my eyes with a quick prayer, and spun around to check. Nothing. Was it over? Have I managed to end years of torment? I walked over to my window to see if there were any signs of the thing, gaining steady confidence with each step. I was excited. Excited to live a life without flinching at every possible hiding spot. Excited to leave the house confidently. Excited to have my independence back. This all ended when I stared into my garden. There it was, standing, staring as it did in my second trip to Disney. I stared back, not only in horror, but sadness. Sadness that my newfound confidence and excitement was crushed so quickly. As I looked on, it raised its hand, and that's when I realized something. 
maybe it's not holding its hand out for the item back, or any kind of repayment. Maybe it's holding its hand out... for me. I know this sounds insane, but I may take it up. Maybe it wants to tell me something, or even show me something. Whatever the case, I needed all this down before I went. If this ends here, presume the worst. If you are listening to this right now, it is necessary that you get out of your house immediately. I don't know how or why this is happening, but as far as I'm concerned, it's not safe for anyone to be listening to this inside right now. Get in your car, get to the nearest town or city, and listen to it there, because I don't know how much longer it is until that thing comes around for you or anyone else. I don't know what this creature is, what it wants, or how many of them exist. All I know is that it is driven to kill, and will stop at nothing to make sure it gets its job done. If you fail to follow these directions, at least lock all your doors and windows, turn off the lights, stay somewhere safe, and make sure your presence is not known. Once you have done that, continue listening to this, and I will explain what is happening to the best of my knowledge. One night, I was sitting at home watching TV. It was a rough week, so I was glad that the weekend finally came. I could sit around doing nothing and not really care about anything. Everything seemed normal, or so I thought. But while I was watching TV, I noticed something odd. Coming out of the forest in my backyard was a man. Well, I'm not sure I could exactly call it that. He was about five feet tall, pale white, completely naked, and had very long arms. And I mean very long arms. They were dragging behind him like dead weight. And the way he walked almost made it seem like they were a burden to him. His hands were dragging a very large object behind him that I could not see at the time. As he took each step, I noticed that he walked with a very lumbering motion. Each step seemed to drain the very light out of him. I almost wanted to help it. That is, until I saw its face. As it got closer to me, I saw that where his eyes were meant to be, there was nothing but two glowing red dots, resting in swollen sockets on his face. He had no nose, and he lacked lips as well. His mouth was stuck in a very wide grin and his teeth were very large. That is to say, if they were teeth, they were more like nails, protruding from his bleeding gums. It had long, jet black hair that almost touched its waist. The thing paid no attention to me, dragging whatever it was carrying behind it like it was his eternal duty. I could hear soft panting. I saw fog coming from its mouth after each breath due to the fact that it was the middle of winter. As he began to get closer to the house, I became more and more terrified. I quickly and silently shut off my TV, turned out my lights, and hid in my bedroom upstairs. I looked out my window and continued to watch his actions. During this, the creature now crossed my long backyard and made it to my house. At this point, I was finally able to see the horrific object it was carrying. In his arms, he was dragging the body of a young man behind him. I couldn't tell what the person looked like. He was too mutilated and torn up for me to be able to distinguish anything human about him. The creature then picked up the body and hung it against the wall with a meat hook, which was already pierced through the man's blood-drenched head. I nearly vomited at the sight of this. The creature walked backwards, stretching out its arms and letting out a subtle yawn. 
it was as if it had finally completed a very hard task. It walked up onto my back porch, its pace quickening after it had hung up the body. I waited in silence and terror, the only noise coming from my quickly beating heart pounding against my ribcage. Then, it looked up at me, and its smile widened. I jumped back in horror as it stepped closer to my back door. It reached out its long arms and grabbed a hold of my doorknob. It slowly pushed open my back door and stepped inside. At this point, I was too stunned to do anything but lock my door and move to the corner of my room. I cowered under a blanket like a child and waited in fear. I knew that I was next. I heard it climbing up my staircase making as little noise as possible. When it reached the top of my staircase, it stopped for a moment, as if contemplating how to mutilate me. Then, it grabbed a hold of the doorknob and began to shake it violently. It kept shaking the doorknob, hoping to break in, but to no avail. I heard the creature walk down the stairs and head out my back door. I watched the creature as it slowly sulked back into the forest. I waited for a few minutes, in case it came back with some kind of axe that chopped down my door. I must have waited in my room for half an hour before I finally decided it was safe. I quickly ran down the stairs and out of my house. I got into my car and drove out of there as fast as I could. Whatever that creature was, I didn't want to be around it when it came back. I went to the nearest town and rented a hotel. I stayed there for the night, and I decided I would report the incident to the police in the morning. I wasn't sure they would believe me, but it was better than getting framed for a murder I didn't commit. The next day, I got up and drove to the police station to report the murders to the police. Right as I entered the station, however, I noticed everything seemed too calm. There were no missing person reports, no murder investigations taking place. It's as if the body I'd seen last night had never existed. It might as well have been my imagination too, because when I returned home, the body wasn't there. In fact, there was no trace that any of last night's events had happened. It was as if it was a dream. Yeah. That had to be it. It had to have been a dream. I probably just woke up frightened and ran out of my house in a panic. I kept telling myself these things, knowing in my heart they were not true. That night, I locked myself in my room and turned off my lights as soon as it got dark out. I wanted to make sure the thing had no idea of my presence. Though it was hard to go to sleep, I finally dozed off, only for a short time, as I was awoken at around 1 in the morning to the sound of scratching. I sat up in my bed and looked out my window, careful to stay hidden. To my horror, the creature was back, scratching against my wall. It was like it wanted to get my attention. When I looked at the wall where it had placed the bodies last night, I saw 12 more in their place. Each one was hanging in a different, gruesome way. Two people hung upside down from barbed wire wrapped around their ankles. Others were nailed to the wall. One man was hanging from his intestines, which had been very precisely removed from his body. I looked away from this terrible sight, waiting for the creature to put me against the wall with the rest of those people. It opened my back door and entered my house, this time quicker, as if it was more eager to add me to his collection. He climbed up the staircase and started shaking on my doorknob. He kept shaking it until it finally snapped and the door slid open. I watched as the monster's silhouette silently crept through my door. It knelt down next to me. At this point, I was too stunned to do anything, and I just sat there, waiting for my fate. 
and placed its hands on my chin and lifted my head up so that I was forced to look into its empty eye sockets. I felt its warm breath against my face, which smelled of blood. And then, to my surprise, it spoke. Father. It spoke with a slow, raspy voice. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This creature calling me his father? Speaking almost like a child saying his first words? I never had a son, and I would know if I did have a son, and it looked like this. It almost looked sad when it spoke. Father, are you scared, father? Why are you scared, father? I kept looking up at the creature in horror. What the heck was going on? Did this thing really think I was his father? I sat in awe and shock at this horrible thing. Father, look outside. It took long breaths between each word, as if talking was a struggle. I made a gift for you. Do you like it? I forced myself to look out the window at the horrific artwork the beast laid out for me to see. The thing really looked at me for a moment as I contemplated an answer. In a shaky voice, I said, y Yes, I, I really, really love your gift. Its smile grew with excitement. It put my head down, and I watched it slowly leave the room. I sighed with relief and moved away from the doorway. Just as I did, however, the creature turned around and looked at me and said something that still, to this moment, causes me to fear for my life and everyone else's life. Its final words to me are the reason I am getting this message out to everyone. As he crept out of my door for the last time, he said, I am not done, father. Stay here. I am going to get more people. He hasn't returned yet. My eyes are in a fervorous affair with the clock, and my focus is none the wiser. The police dispatcher is pleading for me to humour her inquiries, if for no reason other than to keep my consciousness afloat. It is so late, and today has been so challenging. Nevertheless, I'll gratify her with my story, because I am really in no mood to tell it again later. Mariam Cliffington happened into our photo centre again today. These visits are becoming relentless, as are the innumerable poorly photoshopped images on a SanDisk flash drive. Every day is the same process. She purchases our photo kiosk, orders small batches of 5x7 and 4x6 photos, and crones over the photo printer as it squeals its mechanical protests. The unfortunate photo specialist on duty is then scolded by dear old Mariam as The colour in my son's face is coming out too pale and My daughter's dress looks much too washed out becomes as recitable as the Lord's Prayer. The project is then gifted to me as I am the only one who receives her limited mercy. This is due in part because I am the only one in the store qualified as a professional photo editor. I also look just like her son. At least that's what she tells me every time she swoons over the photos I correct. I personally never saw the extreme resemblance. We have similar Hollywood-esque hairstyles, dark stubble, light eyes, and a fair complexion. But that is where the similarities end. Well, that is my general assumption. Truthfully, I have never met him. 
According to Mariam, they don't get along so well these days. Reportedly, her son has become what she calls a changed person after he split with his wife. That always seemed odd to me, because nearly every day, I am draining the red out of a new family photo that she zealously adds in a novice photoshop sessions. It seems the family often stays in touch. Today we discussed more personal topics, such as my college degree and her family get togethers. She told me she was celebrating her granddaughter Gracie's fifth birthday today and was putting together a photo album and baked goodies to send her. Today's photo were of a girl from her previous birthday. She had straw blonde hair, her father's bright blue eyes, rosy red cheeks, and a devilish grin that strongly reminded me of the girl from the movie Problem Child 2. When the topic turned to me being a graduate in multimedia design, she immediately began to give me the shakedown on my talents as a web developer. She wanted me to build her a forum-based website just for her family. She wasn't fond of the public limelight social media granted, but wanted regular updates from her son, granddaughter, their prized show horses, and images from all the reunions they have over the years. I'm not a fan of Mariam. She may treat me in a more humane manner than my colleagues, but she is always so bitter. She carries an air of importance about her that mismatches who she is, like a pug in a sweater made of silk. The last thing I want from a client is a beady pair of eyes reflected behind ancient, dark-rimmed tortoiseshell glasses, with ignorant words laced with the smell of stale coffee and menthol cigarettes. Her grey-black hair was often wild and tangled, as if she was fleeing her home every morning to develop photos which contain the cure for cancer. Despite her lack of self-management, she saw herself as an expert in managing the talents of others. I never inquired about the specifics of her family problems, but I assume this attitude must cause the bulk of it. This sense of entitlement is something I don't blend well with. After endless barrages of questions about my rates, schedule, and ability to tutor her in Photoshop, I gave her my business card and told her to call me in a few weeks. Truthfully, I'm in my two week leave period and on my way to a better job, and this was a simple method to evade her until I would never have to see her again. She seemed content with my proposal and took my card. I told her to forward my congratulations to her granddaughter on a fifth year milestone. As she shuffled out of our store, I looked again at the refuse pile of discolored prints. If her family is so dysfunctional, why does she bring in new photos of her son and granddaughter every other day? Why, as a spitting image of the son she frequently quarrels with, am I so reasonably treated by her? Those suspicions came to fruition a few hours later when a 20-something couple dropped off a few rolls of 35mm film. They had matching black hair, the athletic builds of bicyclists, and eyes that reflected deep kindness, but an even deeper sense of fatigue. The lab's business was running slow today, so I was immediately able to process their order and begin development. The development process is always the same. I feed just enough of the raw film through a machine to attach it to a leader card, which is mechanically guided through the film processor. After it completes its voyage, and the developed film is fed through, I place it on the scanner of our printing machine and check the frames digitally for colour flaws and inconsistencies. The picture showed the young couple celebrating another birthday. A boisterous banner which read, Happy Birthday Mitch! hung above an electric blue neon minibar. The couple was shown holding beer bottles and laughing heartily. The entire set was quite like the photos most young couples bring in. There was a sloppy, drunken kiss here, someone air guitaring on the table there. I began to complacently press the print button after every six frames. Then I noticed a picture of Miriam's son. 
Even though I had never met him, I had seen that face often. It was a face that was branded into the back of my eyes, like the bright red digits of a digital alarm clock in the first few moments of morning consciousness. I was intrigued that these two may also be familiar with the eccentric woman who both frowned upon and adored her family. As I was packing up their photos and ringing up their orders, I decided to make conversation. So, you know Marion Cliffington? I asked casually. Silence. I glanced upward, and the glance became a fixture. A paleness and shock matched both the exhaustion they both wore in their eyes. Are you okay? I recognize the sun in your photos. The girl spoke, tears welling in her eyes. That's our friend Mitch. Those photos were taken a few weeks ago. He passed last week. This order is for his funeral slideshow. Her boyfriend spoke next, clearly unsettled, but retaining his composure, as he quickly recited what I am sure he has gotten used to explaining. He and his daughter were found dead in Mariam's home last Sunday, poisoned. The police have been seeking her for questioning. Have you seen her recently? I was floored. I am rarely one to lose my cool, but I began tripping over my words like they were raised on a high wire. Y yes, I mean, she was just here a few hours ago. She said she was celebrating Grace's fifth birthday. I... She is working on a new photo album. They were new photos. The girl spoke next. We need to call the police immediately. Grace's birthday was the Tuesday before they were found. They didn't enjoy visits with Mariam, but she insisted on being with them to celebrate. Call them I did. I spent the rest of my shift, plus two extra hours, conversing with the police detective and the couple. He asked me to print out the information we had on Mariam, and if we had any ideas of her whereabouts. They inquired about the frequency of her visits, the types of purchases she makes from the rest of the store, her current appearance, and general abnormalities in her behaviour. I gave them what they needed, along with the security footage from the cameras we had hidden around the building. They gave me the direct line to their office, and sent me off with my assurance that I would call them immediately if Marion came into the shop again. The drive home felt relatively non-existent. The thoughts of what occurred seemed to dominate my sense of time while on the road. Had this lady, who compared me to her son, been responsible for his death? For the death of his daughter? Would I see her before the police? I arrived at my house in the same psychological state as when I left the store. I nearly broke my ankle while stumbling over a package that was placed in front of the entryway. I brought it inside, into the light, and saw that the sender's name was Mom. I wasn't sure what the occasion was, but I assumed it was a late Thanksgiving care package. Regardless, it was good to receive mail from her. I wasn't sure where her new apartment was. Now I had her address. 6312 Prospect Road. Inside the package was a thin box of cookies and a neatly wrapped rectangular gift. I hadn't gotten to eat lunch with all the police activity. So I immediately started tanking through the cookies, as if I had also skipped my last five meals. After my fourth cookie, I decided to wipe the crumbs from my hands and see what the mystery gift was. I unceremoniously ripped the red and gold metallic paper off of what appeared to be a small photo album bound in black vinyl. I opened it with giddy curiosity and felt the blood empty from my face. It was a timeline of photos of Marion Cliffington's family. These weren't the fun family get-togethers I had recrafted at the photo lab. I hadn't printed these at all. Page 1 Mitch and Gracie are propped against the arm of a tan leather sofa, daughter wrapped in father's arms. 
Their eyes are sunken and rolled backwards, and their tongues are lolled out of their mouths in an unnatural brown colour. There is dried spittle and yellow foam caught in Mitch's black stubble, and a mixture of blood and vomit on the front of Grace's shirt. The blood vessels in their faces are a sickly blue, and their skin is pale and puffy. This photo is labelled, Tuesday, Happy Birthday Gracie. Page 2. The bodies are placed in a maroon 2013 Toyota RAV4. They've been cleaned up and posed. Mitch is in the front seat, Gracie in the centre back seat. Their skin has continued to swell so their eyes are puffy slits. Their now purple lips have been sewn shut and side stitched into makeshift smiles. One of Mitch's arms is placed on the wheel, the other propped against the passenger seat in a pathetic wave. The label? Wednesday, taking Gracie to school. Page 3. The bodies are now dressed in swimsuits and are posed around a kiddie pool. Mitch had to be propped up in an unknown manner that is cleverly hidden from the frame. He is on his knees at the edge of the pool in blue and white Hawaiian shorts. Gracie is in the pool, positioned on her belly in a striped pink one-piece bathing suit and a matching swim skirt. The hands are duct taped together and their skin has taken on a sickly yellow colour. They are starting to bruise and darken in areas which they have evidently been placed for too long. The label? Thursday, teaching Gracie to swim. Page 4. Mitch is now dressed in a handsome ivory tuxedo, which has a few off-colour stains where his skin is starting to split open. He is at the kitchen table with a full glass of white wine and a lit dining candle in front of him. The sleeves on his arms reveal dark bruising where the tape was wrapped around his daughter's arm the day before. Gracie is not in this picture, but Mariam is. She is grasping one of his rotting hands in one of her own, with a brimming glass of red wine on the other. She wears a motherly smile that sickeningly matches the sewn-on smile her lifeless son now wears. The label? Friday dinner with a boy. Page 5. Gracie is propped up against the wall, the skin of her arms ripped off where the tape was two days prior. Her face is beginning to lose its humanity, but is now coated in makeup worthy of a little Miss Sunshine pageant. Her straw blonde hair is curled and bouncy, and her artificial smile is beginning to tear along the stitching. Next to her is an assortment of porcelain dolls, each made up and dressed with care that is a bit too sophisticated for a five-year-old girl. To the far left of the frame, Mariam's reflection can be seen in a full-body mirror, pointing the camera at the twisted salon she constructed. The label? Saturday, Girls' Night Out. Page 6. There is finally a full frame of the house in which this sickening family montage was photographed. It is a modest, one-story home on the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. The paint is a simple white, and it is beginning to flake from a simple picket fence that marks the perimeter. There are no other homes close by that are visible from the angle of the shot. In the left of the frame, the stables of the prized horses Marion mentioned are visible in the background. The gates are wide open, and the horses are nowhere to be seen. Police cars, ambulances, and yellow crime scene tape blocks the rest of the view, except for the mailbox. The address on the mailbox? 6312 Prospect Road. The sides of the frame indicate motion blur and plastic panelling. Mariam photographed this from a moving vehicle, likely from far away. The label reads, Sunday the family gets to see policemen in action on career day. On the final page, Mariam is standing in front of my house with the package I had just opened. The label? Thursday, dropping off goodies for my favourite son.
In that moment of realization, weakness took control of my body. Not just from the imagery I was subjected to, but from a sickening feeling that burned in my stomach and intestines. Words from earlier were ripping through my skull. You look just like my son. He and his daughter were found dead in Mariam's home last Friday, poisoned. I forced myself to scan the backgrounds of those horrible pictures. On the first day, in Grace's lap, was the cookie tin I had just eaten from. This package was not from my mother. It was from a crazed mother who thought I was a son, guided to my home from the business card I gave her. Now, here we are. I don't think I have much time left. I'm starting to lose focus. My eyes are in a fervorous affair with the clock, and my focus is none the wiser. Maybe they'll get married and elope. I'll invite this dispatcher to the wedding if I make it through this. I vaguely realize that doesn't make sense, but I don't mind. I am so tired, and now I can't stop coughing. I think I hear sirens in the distance, but I'm not sure if the ambulance has a cure for vomiting blood. Someone is coming up the stairs. I have to go now. Mariam is here, and she wants to give Gracie swimming lessons. It took me longer than the other kids to grow out of cartoons. I loved all those childhood classics that were featured on Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon and such. It's funny, if you go on any nostalgia blogs nowadays, you'll see people acting like they always loved cartoons. But I bet there was a time they denounced their love just to seem cool. Anyway, this carried over when I was in my early years of high school and bored in IT class. Everyone was just doodling away on paint playing flash games, or reading random pages found on the web. We had one of those teachers that never really cared about what we did, as long as the work was done. My favourite cartoon at the time that I was binging was Batman the Animated Series. Out of boredom, I was just searching away random pages on search engines. First, I typed in Batman the Animated Series Trivia, which came up with a plethora of random facts about the show. I then found some little interviews about the behind the scenes and making of, which was pretty interesting. After hearing the same facts over and over though, I changed things up a bit. I decided to search for fan sites to see what others thought of the show. First I found some popular blogs sharing fan fictions and theories, I even found a few hate pages which peeved me. But alas, I eventually fell into a monotonous grind through the pages of search results. I eventually hit the double digit figures of search pages, which is when you find the more bizarre and less relevant pages. I came across some role playing forums, illegal streaming sites of the show, and even a fanatic who acted out episodes in costume. I was just mindlessly clicking through these, until I hit a generic, albeit amateur looking page. It had a generic spiel about how they loved the show, and there were pages of commentary written down on an episode by episode basis. I was curious, but as I was getting into things, a pop-up came up. You have been selected for a chance to win £100,000. Obviously, I had been warned by my parents to be cautious about things that are too good to be true, but I was also at that age where I felt I was destined for something special, and this could be it. I hesitantly clicked on it, and it led to some questionnaire, one question at a time. First, it asked a generic question about Batman. Luckily, I had been reading all the hidden details of the show, and proudly clicked the right answer in the drop-down. Correct, it congratulated me with. This gave me a great feeling, and a small shot of adrenaline. This could be it. I could be rich in a matter of seconds was the thought racing in my mind. This all left me on the next question. What is your name? I was hesitant now. 
I was especially warned to never fill in personal details on the internet. Class was ending soon and I needed to be fast. If I answered, I could get in trouble. And if I left it, this opportunity would slip me by. In a panic, I looked around my class for inspiration. And my eyes met with the people in my class. Then I came up with a genius idea. I could use someone else's name. First, I looked at my best friend. If all this turned out to be legitimate, he would definitely understand and share the wealth with me. However, if he got in trouble, I would feel like I betrayed him. I was scared to ask him as I didn't want him to laugh at me in case this was all fake. Next, I turned to the big kid at the back of the class. Pete was basically the school bully. I thought if things went sour, I wouldn't mind him taking the fall. He'd gotten away with so much in this school that anything bad happening to him would be karmic justice. But then I thought of the potential good, and how he wouldn't even think twice about keeping all the money to himself. Time was running out, and I had to act quick. I could see some people packing away their stationery early to leave quickly for the upcoming lunch break. Then, the perfect idea hit me. Dexter. He was basically the class nerd. This name didn't help him, leaving him the most cliche nickname, Point Dexter. He was weak-willed, easily pushed around. A bad quality to have, but if he got the money, I could easily sway him into being on my side and splitting the pool with me. And if things went sour, I could easily deny any connection. I didn't really have much connection with him, and I wasn't that type of kid so no one would suspect me. It was the perfect choice. I quickly typed in his name, which led to a box for his address. I had it offhand from his birthday party flyer, which no one showed up to. It would have been social suicide to have shown up. I pulled out the creased flyer from my backpack and hastily filled it in. After that, the pop-up just thanked me and closed. It was anticlimactic to say the least. It was just in time though, as everyone was flooding out for lunch and I didn't want to look suspicious, so I closed everything down and left. Weeks went by and seemingly nothing happened. I didn't want to ask Dexter about it as I didn't want to look stupid that I'd fallen for such a thing and I didn't want him to know I was filling in his details on random sites. He certainly never acted different in that time so I figured he hadn't received the money. It was slowly hitting me that I may have been duped. I was watching him at lunch to see if he brought anything with him that may show he secretly received a lump of money, but he just pulled out some simple sandwiches and a chocolate bar. One thing I did notice though, was that he was acting kind of skittish. He would occasionally pop his head up from eating, look around with wide eyes, and strafe back down to eat some more. I figured he was just looking out for kids who were looking to grief him. He really was a big target for many bullies. A week or two later, and things started getting more noticeable, but not in a good way. His grades started slipping. Now, he was known as Point Dexter for a reason. He was so smart, he usually knew things the teachers didn't. But now, he was noticeably lacking behind. His behaviour was becoming more erratic too. He would sometimes lash out at other kids if they walked too close to him and caught him off guard. He would start screaming, seemingly at random. This started to distress the other kids, me included, and Dexter had to be sent out every so often to calm him down. I started to feel like this was my fault. I mean, I put together that this all started after I filled in his details on that pop-up. I nonchalantly brought this up to my mom, the behaviour, not the pop-up, and she gave me an interesting explanation. As lightly as possible, she told me he's a little… special. She explained that he might act odd from time to time because he had mild autism. I later learned that he was diagnosed on the cusp of the spectrum where he could be in school with the regular kids, 
which is an offer his parents took up. This explanation was easy to stomach, and as bad as this sounds, I rejoiced inside knowing it wasn't my fault. Time went by and things were getting worse. He would show up to school exhausted and pale, dark circles around his eyes. I no longer felt bad about the pop-up though, I more felt sorry for his parents. I couldn't imagine what it was like for them. But I just accepted this as how things were. Eventually, his behaviour got so out of hand that he had to be taken out of class regularly. Usually, he didn't make it past 10 minutes in class before needing to be sent out. It didn't matter anyway. All he'd do was stare out the window with his crazy, wide eyes until he would start screaming and panicking away. It was too disruptive to be sorted out every time it happened. It wasn't long until he stopped showing up completely. I asked my parents about it, and they were oddly quiet about it. I asked the other kids, but they said they had a similar response from their parents. We were simply constantly told not to worry. A week later, and more inquiries, all the parents seemingly at the same time all started telling us that they simply moved Dexter to a special needs school which could accommodate his condition. Some of the other kids didn't believe their parents, but it was spread enough that it was eventually settled as truth. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this is because of what I found out recently. I found out what really happened. He didn't move. He was kidnapped. On his bed was a note left in scratched, barely legible writing saying, Dexter is a greedy boy. Dexter is a greedy boy. Dexter is a greedy boy. Over and over again. After he went missing, a silent search operation was conducted around the town to see if they could find him. While searching the industrial estate to see if he was hiding away in an abandoned warehouse, they found his body. His body was stuffed with coins and notes recently stolen from a bank. There was also evidence of the worst things imaginable having happened to him, but you don't need me to describe them to you. It was decided to be kept from the kids to stop fear-mongering and trauma, plus telling the kids wouldn't have made us more safer anyway. This wasn't a random kidnapping. There was plenty of evidence that it was premeditated, planned, and was a one-off. However, no evidence could be found of a motive. Except for what I know. I think I may have gotten my classmate killed. Seven days ago, I was driving my son, Zach, home from school, when a drunk driver t-boned us. The paramedics managed to drag us out out of our flipped vehicle. As soon as I woke up, I looked around the room for my son. I tried to get out of bed, but a nurse rushed into the room and settled me back in. He looked at me for a second before saying, your son is in critical condition right now, but you need to stay on your bed for at least another day before we can let you leave your room. I tried to argue back, but the words wouldn't come out of my mouth. The nurse left after a couple of seconds. The rest of the day, I sat on the bed and forced myself to stay strong for my son. I knew he couldn't see me right now. But I was all he had now, after my wife was found in front of the Walmart parking lot. She was stabbed a total of 12 times, and her purse was emptied out. They never found out who killed her. That was just two years ago. Zach was just eight at the time. The day at the funeral was the hardest day of my life. I had to explain that his mother was gone. He didn't cry, he just nodded and stared at the ground for the rest of the day. 
It took over a year for things to go back to some type of normalty. The thought of Zack dying did go through my mind several times, but I quickly dismissed the thought and remained hopeful. The doctor came into my room around 7 at night to run a couple of tests. I tried to ask him about my son, but he just gave me a sympathetic look before telling me that I was pretty much fine besides a couple of scrapes and bruises. I asked if I could go see my son now, but with a sigh, he said, Harold, let me be completely honest with you. There really isn't much you can do right now. You can see him tomorrow after we release you, but just understand that he is a lot worse off than you. There is a chance he may not make it, but our doctors are trying the very hardest. Get some rest and make sure you mentally prepare yourself before you see your son. He gave me a sad nod and walked out of the room. That night, I couldn't sleep. Instead, I sat on my bed and ran through every single memory I had of Zack and me. I thought of every time we sat in the kitchen table, eating dinner and laughing. I thought of the times my wife, Zack and I would sit on the sofa and watch a movie. And I thought of the times we cried together over the loss of his mother. That night was a mixture of half smiles and tears. At nine o'clock, the nurse came into my room and gave me a nod before unhocking every little thing that was attached to my body. Thirty minutes later, I was following closely behind the nurse to where Zack was. We stopped in front of room 437. I took a deep breath before I walked through the door and saw my son's nearly lifeless body lying on the hospital bed. Each step I took towards my son revealed more and more injuries that his small, fragile body took. His right arm was rubbed absolutely raw. His left eye was slightly opened from the dent that was now on his face, and his legs and other arms were littered with randomly placed stitches. The room started to spin, and I started to go limp, but a doctor grabbed me from behind and placed me on a seat. He handed me a glass of water before saying, He seems a little more stable now, but these next two days are the most critical for him. We will have a doctor for him at all hours, and if we get any type of alert, we will definitely be there for him. You can stay with him if you'd like. I gave him a nod and told him that I was going to stay with him until he wakes up. He placed a hand on my shoulder before he walked out of the room. The next day and a half went by and absolutely nothing happened. The doctors and nurses would stop in occasionally, but they would leave right after they finished their tasks. That evening at 9.37, my son's heart stopped and my whole world stopped. I saw doctors and nurses rushing into the room but I was completely stuck on the chair. It took everything out of me to finally get out of my chair and rush up to my son, but one of the doctors held me back. I screamed, pushed, and sobbed during the 18 seconds my son was dead. For the next two days, I stood next to my son. I didn't sleep, eat, or drink anything. I wanted him to somehow know that I was with him. I wanted to somehow help him get out of the coma and into my arms again. At 11.14pm, my son finally opened his eyes and looked up at me. It had taken him four and a half days for him to get out of his coma, and the only thing I wanted to do was cry and hold him. He gave me a small smile before he looked up and frowned. Before I could do anything, Zack went into absolute hysterics. He started off by letting out a series of screams, 
screams of absolute agony. He tried ripping off his IV and everything else connected to his body, but I held his arms down as carefully as I could before calling for a doctor. It took over three hours for Zach to finally calm down. It was two in the morning by then. I was absolutely exhausted, but I walked up to him and sat down next to him while gingerly holding his hand. I fell asleep around five in the morning. I woke up to the sound of Zach's voice. When I looked up, I saw a nurse carefully feeding him. He was telling her about how we go to the park every Saturday and proceeded to ask her if he would be able to go with me this Saturday. She gave him a smile and said, Well, if you eat plenty of food and do everything the doctors say, you might be able to go very soon. I have to go now, Zach, but why don't you talk to your dad now? It looks like he's awake. Zach quickly turned to me and gave me a smile before talking about how the doctor told him he was being extra good and that he deserves a new toy. I laughed and told him that once we were out, I would give him any toy he wanted. My son was physically hurt, but it seemed like he was back to normal otherwise. The next couple of days went by in a blur. Throughout the day, I would talk with him, read a couple of books to him given by the nice doctor, and watched a couple of his favourite shows on the TV. I felt beyond lucky. I had my son still. My one reason to keep living. Last night, my son started to talk about his experience, and I really don't know what the hell he went through. I was reading to him when he held his arm up and said, Everything became really black, and then it felt like I was dreaming. Before I could say anything back, he took a deep breath and said, I dreamed about when mommy was here. We were eating dinner, but everything was quiet. Mommy and you were talking, but I couldn't hear anything. I tried to say something, but I couldn't hear myself. I started to scream, and then everything went black again. I tried to hold his hand to reassure him that he was fine now, but he pushed away and looked up at me with eyes filled with torment. His lips quivered before he continued with his experience. Then, a bright light was all around me. I started to feel warm and happy, really happy, like when mommy was here. I tried to move, but I was floating, and so I stayed still while I floated to where I was supposed to go. It got too bright, so I closed my eyes till I stopped. When I opened my eyes, I had to close them again because I saw the brightest light I have ever seen. It spoke to me. It said that I was dead. It told me that I was going to be here for a little while before he sent me back to you. I tried to ask him to take me back now, but it told me that I needed to stay here. He took a couple deep breaths, and a couple of tears fell from his face before he continued. I started floating again, and I was taken to another room, but this one was smaller. I waited for a long time, but mommy came into the room. She was happy and gave me a hug. But then she started to scream. I tried to keep looking at her, but a knife kept going inside of her body. She started to bleed everywhere, and I got scared. I closed my eyes and looked away. She stopped screaming, and I looked back at mommy. She was dying, but she told me that she loved me, and that she will see me again. But she told me it would be a long time. I gave him a smile and told him that mommy was waiting for us in a special place. That is when Zack turned to me and said, No, not us, just me. I saw who was holding the knife. It was you. She told me you were going to another place. 
I'm sorry, Daddy, but Mommy is not waiting for you. She told me that you were clever enough to get away with killing her, but you can't escape death. Everybody dies, and so will you. I didn't know what to say to him. I loved my wife and son, but I couldn't handle how I became the third wheel. I knew I couldn't beat the bond between a mother and a child, and I did the only thing that would allow my son to fully appreciate me as much as he could. This morning, I went home to get my laptop. I'm back now with my son, and I'm writing this out to you guys. Do any of you guys have any proof of an afterlife? Did my son just have an awfully vivid dream? Or was what he experienced real? It seems like more of a coincidence that he would be able to place the blame on me, when the police couldn't even trace it back to me. Uh-oh, Julia said, sitting in a playpen. Dan could hear her sloshing a juice around in the sippy cup from across the room as she waved and attempted to say hello. Hi, baby girl, he said, lounging in the recliner next to the fireplace and looking intently at his laptop. He gave a half-hearted wave back, still reading the news. As he switched between his multiple open windows, from a comic to stock listings to a news website, his daughter tossed the cup over the edge. He heard it hit the ground, glanced up quickly, but decided to deal with the cup later. Then, he heard the rattling as she picked up one of her toys. Eh, oh, she said again. Her wave communicated to her father by way of rattling. Hi again, beautiful, he said offering a half-hearted wave back in the general direction of the playpen. He couldn't remember being this tired since Julia had been born. Despite the loss of sleep, the general frantic energy his adorable ball of joy seemed to possess was contagious. With Lisa gone for the weekend though, the girl was taking a toll on the young father. He'd spent that morning trying to teach her to play catch her still developing arms, reacting on a significant time delay from reality. Then, they'd gone to the park for a picnic, after an hour and a half of preparation, only to have to rush back home when it started raining. Some ridiculous series of videos featuring badly computer-animated insects dancing to Mozart had dominated her afternoon, and by extension, his. Anytime he wasn't shaking his booty to Wolfgang's fat beats, Julia would start crying. She'd gone down for an hour-long nap around 4pm, but that seemed to supply her with more than enough energy to try talking for the next four hours. Now, at 9pm, Julia was up later than some teenagers. If Lisa were home, Dan knew the girl would already be sleeping soundly in a crib, but Dan took the electric razor approach to bedtime once in a while, let the batteries run out completely. The only catch was, his batteries were running out too. He hoped hers went first. He closed his eyes for a moment and thought about calling Lisa. As the home's main breadwinner, she had a district meetings a couple times a year, but he knew that the events tended to be half vacation. He didn't want to bother her. He jerked his head back up. No, he was not going to pass out before his toddler. Maybe Julia could recharge his batteries a bit though. Slamming his legs down to shut the recliner and jumping to his feet, he turned on his play voice. Hey there girl. Wanna try- Eh-oh! She cried, 
standing against the back of her playpen and gleefully waving her rattling, psychedelic-covered stuffed butterfly. He shut up and stared at her. His dumb, happy dad look froze on his face. She wasn't looking at him, and she wasn't waving at him. She was facing the hallway to his right, on her end of the room, which led to the bedroom, nursery, and bath. Um, hey there, he said. Over here. Hi, baby girl. She looked at him for just a moment, smiling the smile of someone who was already happy before you showed up. Then, she turned her attention back down the hallway. Uh oh she squealed, waving back. He frowned, glancing at the hall from where he stood, even though he couldn't see down it. Then, looking back at the rapt joy on the toddler's face, he stepped closer. Julie's attention down the hall seemed to fade as he got closer and she plopped on her bottom and picked up a doll as soon as he stood in front of the playpen and stared down at the unlit, but obviously empty, hallway. As a child-proofing measure, they always shut the three doors in the hallway, the nursery on the left, the bedroom on the right, and the bathroom at the end. They all looked to be quite closed. But Dan, who had always valued paranoia over false security, strode back to the mantle and grabbed the fire poker from its stand, then returned to the hallway. Holding the poker in his right hand like a truncheon more than a baseball bat, he didn't bother with stealth as he approached the nursery. He flung the door open, flicked on the light, and did a quick sweep of the room, behind the door and in the closet. Leaving that door open, he went for the bathroom next. With slightly more hesitation, he opened that door and flipped on the light. The bathroom was small, efficient, Lisa said, and the only possible hiding place was behind the shower curtain. Remembering a horror movie cliche so universal it was almost a part of the human brainstem, he slowly stepped to the bath, held the poker with both hands, and hooked it around one side of the curtain. He forced it open. Nothing. He rolled his eyes as he stepped back out of the room, leaving the door open and light on. Now, just one room left. Now that he was this close, he realized he'd been wrong. His bedroom door was definitely ajar, if only by a touch just enough that it didn't latch. He didn't imagine he would have done this. He closed his eyes for a moment and took a deep breath. Then he opened them and lightly kicked the door open. His left hand gripped the poker while his right scrambled for the light switch. Finding it, he bathed the room in incandescent safety. There was nothing apparently out of place in the room, but he gaped at the opposite wall. The window was wide open. There was a moment of blind, frenzied, spiders crawling through the brain terror, and he held the poker up and spun around the room quickly, sure he'd miss something horrifying. Then, as he saw the damp floor, he realized it hadn't been raining for hours, he remembered. He'd opened all the windows earlier to save on AC. When they came back from their aborted picnic, he'd shut them all due to the rain, except this one. Julia had been crying for her movie just as he'd reached the hall, and before he'd gotten to his bedroom, he was out there turning on the classical music loving bugs and dancing with them. He quickly stepped onto the soggy carpet, went to the window, and shut it, for all the good it did now. He needed to get some rags and towels. Leaving the third door open, he started back down the hallway, 
eyes locked on Julia, playing in a pen. The next thing he knew, he was walking much more quickly down the hallway to Julia. Baby girl, what is that? He asked, unable to maintain a play voice this time. Julia was grinning, eyes wet and shining, clutching to her chest, a teddy bear. She didn't seem bothered by the bear's missing button eye, or split leg seam, or its dampness, or the smell of years of mildew, mold and rot. Dan thought his face was going to fall off and hit the floor. He barely mouthed a swear word, then out of some programmed parent response, he didn't finish it. Come on baby girl, we're getting out of here. Scooping her up and being enveloped in the bear's stench. He wanted her to let go of it, but didn't have any intention of sparing the time to fight with her. He held her with one arm and fished in his pockets for his keys. They weren't there. His already fiery panic almost consumed him. Before he remembered, he'd left them on the bench by the front door. He made it to the door in three long strides, grabbing the keys and forcing his feet into some already tied shoes, not bothering to pull the backs out from under his heels. He threw open the door and slammed it behind him. He didn't even consider pausing momentarily to lock it behind him. As he approached his car, almost running, he hit the keyless entry button and heard the reassuring clunk. His head hit the roof as he slid into the driver's seat, Julia still over his shoulder. Screw the car seat just this once, he thought. Keys were slammed into the ignition, car whipped into the road in reverse, all thoughts of seatbelts or possible destinations driven from his mind by the singular, overwhelming need to get as far away from his house as possible. A block down the road, he exhaled for what seemed like the first time in ages, and he realized Julia was breathing steadily. Her cheek rested on his shoulder, arm pressed against his, the hand still clutching her new toy. Despite everything, he laughed one shrill, almost bark-like release of adrenaline. Her breathing changed immediately, of course, as she woke back up. He felt her shift her head, propping her chin up, her view now over his shoulder. A moment later, he felt her arm lift from his. In his peripheral vision, he could see the foul bear swinging wildly as Julia waved into the back seat. Eh, oh she said. Life is supposed to be better after graduation. You walk across that stage, grab your diploma, and then you're welcomed into the real world with open arms. All those parties, all the cheering, all the gifts, all the congratulations you get, it's all supposed to represent the new world you're about to join. I mean, you just made it through the hell of high school, four years of stress and drama, and now you're finally free to be an adult. Life after high school isn't what you think it is. They don't tell you everything. They don't tell you the real secret of the world, of society, of what life is truly about. They don't tell you about the never-ending cycle of money, the endless grind to make a buck. They don't tell you about greed. If I had known, maybe I would have been better prepared for the time after graduation. Maybe I wouldn't have been so self-righteous, and maybe I wouldn't have ended up where I am now. Sleep watching, the newest way to make some quick cash. Manny told me about it. Old, good-hearted Manny. He meant well, 
He really did. I mean, he has been my best friend since freshman year. He didn't know what would happen. We both experienced the newfound struggle for money after graduation. We're just kids. Lazy, stuck-up kids. We thought that we were too good for some entry-level job at McDonald's or Walmart. We wanted something that was going to bring in money quickly and easily. So, him being the best friend that he is, he looked around online. It didn't take him long to find exactly what we both wanted. He found sleep watching, a job in which you get paid to do absolutely nothing. Ollie, all you have to do is sit there and stay awake, he had texted me. The way he explained it, sleep watching would be the easiest job on earth. And just like most things that end in disaster, it seemed too good to be true. So, me being exuberant about my brand new job opportunity, I raced to my computer with all the excitement of a boy who had just found Wonka's fifth and final golden ticket. Didn't talk to anyone else about it, just sat down at my desk, launched Chrome, and began looking up the wonderful world of sleep watching. You see, it's a pretty ingenious idea. People are afraid of being alone. With how connected the world is these days, they can't stand the loneliness of the night. So, of course, these people would pay extremely well just to have someone sit up with them while they rest for the night. Sleep-watching.net, as I found out, is the premier place to get all of your sleep-watching needs. Just apply to join as a trusted watcher and in a few days be matched with a sleeper in need. I signed up that day. Oliver Twitch, I typed into the bar, putting in information you shouldn't put into any website. I assured myself though, I mean, I understood that sleepwatching.net needed to do a security check on me, make sure I wasn't joining for any nefarious reasons. It took a few days for the acceptance email to finally come in. I remember getting it. How I had been refreshing my email endlessly, just waiting for the green light to pay dirt. I immediately logged into the website, and to my surprise, I already had an alert from a sleeper in need. In that moment, I wasn't thinking. I just knew that someone was willing to pay me. I clicked on the link, and it gave me a brief profile of the sleeper who wanted me. Her name was Viola, a sweet name for an innocent old lady. 74 and alone in life. Her husband had died a few years earlier, and her family had leased out an apartment and forgotten about her. She put on her profile that she had some trouble sleeping of late, and thought that having someone younger there with her would do a lot to ease her insomnia. I greedily accepted. The rate for the job was amazing. Old people pay extremely well. We messaged a little that day. Just short messages. She wanted to make sure I was okay with the job and the pay. All she needed me to do was to be on the webcam feed. She said she was fine with me doing anything else during the night. It had been around noon when we talked, so I decided to take a nap. I had to be prepared for an all-nighter. An all-nighter that would hopefully get me paid. It got dark around nine where she lived. I was an hour behind, so it was still daylight when we got ready to call. Before I hit the dial button, a pop-up window appeared on my screen. A special message straight from sleepwatchers.net. The rules, it said across the top of the page. Listed below this simple heading was a short list. Number one, do not fall asleep. Number two, for no circumstance may you wake the sleeper. Number three, do not touch the red emergency button unless there is an emergency. Number four, do not 
fall asleep. I had laughed at the rules at the time. They were all basic. Common sense that anyone should have known before taking a job as a watcher. I clicked the agree button at the bottom of the page and then waited for my call to Viola to connect. She was such a sweet old lady. She had this innocent smile on her face as she appeared on the screen and she looked genuinely happy to see me. Hi, Oliver, she said. Thank you so much for doing this. I hope this isn't too much trouble and that you have a good night. I assured her that I would, that I had a few tabs open that I would be working on while she slept. I told her good night and she laid down into bed. In what seemed like just a few short moments, she was peacefully asleep. I watched her for a while. There's a strange peace in watching somebody sleep, watching their chest move as they breathe slowly. I was watching Viola at a most vulnerable. I knew there wasn't anything to worry about, but still, having a life in your hands can change you. After just a little while of watching Viola sleep, I began surfing the web. I had all night to endlessly search. So, lucky me, I was getting paid to do what I would have been doing that night anyways. The night went by quietly. There was one point during the night I thought I heard something come from the video feed. Almost sounded like breathing. But me being the smartass kid that I am, knew that it was just the sound all video cam feeds make when both sides are silent. I now realized that only one side of the feed had been silent. In the morning, when the first rays of the sun were beginning to fill Viola's room, she woke up. No alarm for her, just sunlight. I happened to be watching as this happened. Just doing my job, you know. Her first move was to look to her side, the empty portion of her bed. She placed her hand on the unused pillow there, and I could have sworn I saw her body shudder. Then, I guessed, she gathered herself, and she turned to look at her laptop, which was sitting on the desk next to her bed. She smiled that genuine smile again when she saw me, asked me how my night had been. I told her it had went smoothly. She sighed a sigh of relief and thanked me. She told me she had just had the best sleep in weeks and to have a good day and then hung up the feed. I'm a teenager, I'm used to all-nighters, but with my job done, I gladly went to bed with a smile on my face. The next few nights were the same. I would video call Viola around 8 at night and she would be asleep by 8.05. Thank God the internet is endless. I learned so much endless crap during those nights. One night, the peacefulness of our schedule was interrupted. I remember it in some detail. Viola woke up around three, drowsily nodded at me, and headed to the bathroom, which, from the camera angle, I could see was connected to the bedroom by a small door on the other side of her bed. At that point, I never really looked at the feed. I mean, nothing ever changed on it, so there wasn't any point. I only ever really looked to have a moment of peace from the bluntness of the internet. I was watching while she was in the restroom, though. Maybe out of boredom, or maybe because I wanted her to feel safe when she got back into bed. I can't really remember. I saw something while she was in the restroom. It was only for a second, but I swear to you that I saw it. A hand. An oversized, bleach-white hand. It was inching its way out from behind the curtain that covered the window. I only saw it for a second, but it raised every hair on my body into attention. I continued staring into that same spot trying to catch any more evidence of something being wrong. Nothing happened 
so I shrugged it off, blaming it on the mixture of midnight drowsiness and Red Bull. Viola came out of the restroom and went back to bed. Her only communication to me was that soft smile before her head hit the pillow and she was peacefully back out. The way she fell asleep so quickly, she treated sleep like a luxury. A luxury that I could tell she had been missing out on as of late. I felt proud to be the person that could bring that luxury back to her. A few nights later, five nights ago, everything changed. The night started out normal. Viola and I following our established routine. Her whispering a good night Ollie to me and passing out. The quietness of a room. The sound of me clicking away into Google. Trying to find some new information that I had yet to exhaust. Everything was normal. It's all my fault. I didn't nap as much as I should have that day. I didn't have a Red Bull on me. I didn't try hard enough to stay awake. I fell asleep. I broke the rules. I slept hard. I was out for at least an hour, drooling on my keyboard, dead to the world and useless to Viola. I woke up to a sound. I think I heard some kind of bang, but I can't remember. Maybe a buzzer? I'm not sure. My head came up quick though. I wasn't sure as to what was going on, but I think that my body instinctively knew that something was wrong. After I figured out where I was, I went straight to Viola's tab. She was peacefully asleep. Whatever had awoken me hadn't disturbed her in the slightest. I smiled to myself. With that nap, I would be good to go the rest of the night, and Viola was still perfectly okay. That's when I saw him. The ghoul I now call the Watcher. My smile was instantly gone. He was standing in the corner of Viola's room, mostly hidden by the darkness. What I could make out about him was his extreme height and his narrow body. I could also see his eyes. They were white, entirely white. They seemed to be reflecting some ungodly light, and they were directed straight at me. I couldn't move. Fear was like ice, and in that moment, it froze me. He began to move towards Viola. He didn't walk, but he didn't float like a ghost. He moved smooth, but at the same time, his moves were rigid. Viola's back was to him, and her sleeping face was pointed in my direction. This is when I broke rule too. You see, I did the only thing that I could think to do. I yelled. I yelled and I screamed for Viola, trying to wake her up. It worked. I now wish it hadn't. Her eyes popped open and instantly locked with mine. As she did this though, the Watcher was upon her. He began slamming both of his fists into her body over and over again. He made this sick, wet sound. A rhythmic thud. I saw it all. It was like having a front row seat to a band that disgusts you. I saw the look of surprise she had when she first woke up. The confusion on her face when he first slammed that white fist into her. And then the fear as she realized what was happening. Blood was everywhere. It wouldn't stop coming. Viola's eyes were on me the whole time. She was crying. She had given up and she was steadily weeping as he beat her. Ollie! I barely heard a whisper. Help me! I tried to do the only thing I could. 
I grabbed the mouse and clicked on that red emergency button. The one that's supposed to be used only during emergencies. It didn't work. This feature is restricted at the current time to user Wishbone43. Reason? Disobedience of the rules. Some way, somehow, Sleepwatchers.net knew I had fallen asleep. It knew, and now it was punishing me. I turned my attention back to the thing as it continued slamming its oversized fists into Viola. Those once white hands were covered in blood. Viola's eyes were lifeless. She was gone. I could still hear her plead for help in my ears. I cried. I sat in front of my computer with my head in my hands. And I cried. Viola died because of me. An innocent old lady died because I couldn't keep my stupid little eyes open. Remember how I talked about how it feels to have a life in your hands? Well, it really, really sucks when that life is lost and you're to blame. The tears wouldn't stop coming. They still haven't. I listened to the continuous slamming of the watcher's fists into Viola's body. After a little bit of time, they finally stopped. It took every ounce of courage that I had to look up, but I did. Those white eyes were staring at me. Those huge white hands, covered in Viola's blood, hung limply at his sides. Those eyes didn't say anything, but I know what that thing was trying to tell me. It's all your fault, Ollie. I haven't slept since that night. Viola haunts my dreams, and if I close my eyes for even a second, she's there, screaming at me, cursing my name with that innocent voice. She knows it's my fault, and she won't let me forget it. That thing is coming for me. Viola's death was just the beginning, the first part of a two-part punishment. My death will be part two. I don't know what to do. I haven't told anyone. I know anyone that I could possibly tell would think I'm insane. And if they didn't instantly call me crazy, well then they would know that Viola's death is my fault. It isn't that monster's hands that are covered in blood. It's mine. He has been getting closer every night. At first, it was just shadows. Things that could be mistaken as nothing. But now, now I hear his breathing. I see those blood-soaked hands everywhere. That low, almost silent breathing. I hear it no matter where I go. He is always watching. I know he's here right now, behind me as I record this standing over my shoulder and listening to what I have to say about him. This nightmare is torture. I'm going to go insane soon if I don't sleep. Please, I need help. I'm begging you. I will give you everything I own. Just please, go find my account on Sleep Watchers. Please be my watcher. I won't make it through another night without one. Don't let me die. Don't fall asleep. I was a 24 year old good for nothing mooch that lived at my parents house. Well. That's what my father said to my mother in the bedroom late at night. Of course, maybe, if they didn't continue to give me a $50 allowance a week, I would have probably tried to find a job sooner than that. I really didn't feel right about accepting the money, but you have to be downright stupid to refuse free money. 
The next day, my mother asked me if I could at least start putting in applications. She was tired of defending me, and honestly, I was tired of listening to them argue. That afternoon, my mom drove me to the heart of downtown Nashville, Tennessee. She figured there were enough part-time opportunities for me. The first place I went into was a small candy shop called Rocket Fizz. The manager was nice enough, but she did tell me that they were fully covered in terms of staff. She said she would let me know if they ended up needing anyone else. After purchasing a couple of sweets, I walked out of the store and mindlessly walked around for a couple of minutes while shoving sour gummies in my mouth and taking drags off of my cigarette. I walked up to a crosswalk, and while waiting for the light to turn green, I saw a, now hiring, no experience necessary, sign on a small white building called Cafe 1987. When I walked inside of the coffee shop, I looked around and saw that it wasn't really anything special. It looked like almost every single indie coffee shop out there. Small wooden tables, uncomfortable looking chairs, and the smell of roasted coffee beans filled the air. The barista behind the counter looked at me with a smile before handing me a menu and asking, Would you like to try our mango smoothie? They're absolutely delicious and made with natural ingredients. I shook my head and said, No, I... I saw the sign and I was wondering if you guys were still hiring. He looked uneasy for a second before asking, Are you sure you don't want to try a mango smoothie? It's absolutely amazing to drink in this hot weather. It'll keep you healthy with all the vitamins inside. For today only, it's actually $3 so I highly recommend it. I shook my head again and asked if I could just have an application. At first, it looked like he was getting more and more disappointed. But the more I looked at his face, the more I realized that it looked like he was getting older. His thick brown hair started to fall out and was replaced with frail white hair. I started to panic and put my hand on his shoulder and asked him if he was okay. Are you absolutely sure you don't want a mango smoothie? It is the best for health, and you will notice yourself getting younger. Quickly, I took a five out of my wallet and slammed it on the counter and nodded my head. The man let out a sigh, turned around, and started making the smoothie. Once he finished, he turned around and handed it to me. He looked young again, but he still had a nervous look on his face. I mean... It looked like the man was five seconds away from death. I took a small sip and gave him a nod. I was still scared out of my mind, and the only thing I wanted to do was get out. I grabbed the smoothie out of his hand and started walking out of the door when I heard him whisper, I'm so sorry. I turned around and looked at him, but he was staring at me with a blank look on his face. I turned back around and tried leaving, but my hand kept sliding off of the door handle. Scared and frustrated, I shot my arm out as hard as I could towards the door, but a pain erupted deep inside of me. I fell to the ground and writhed in pain. Once the pain was gone, I looked back at him and told him to open the door. But he just kept staring at me and said, I can't. I would have left if I could. You can't either. It told me you couldn't. I took a deep breath, calmed myself down, and said, Alright man, this was funny. I bought a smoothie. Now let me out. Please don't make me call 911. He let out a lifeless chuckle before saying, Try it. Your body won't let you. While glaring at him, I took out my phone and dialed 911. I tried talking when a man answered the phone, but a pain erupted in my midsection. I still tried to speak, 
but words weren't coming out of my mouth. I could only let out a series of grunts. The man sighed and said, All right, man, it's actually a crime to call us when there isn't an emergency. Please do not call again or we will send an officer your way. He let out another aggravated sigh after I let out another grunt and disconnected the call. After a couple of seconds, the pain passed. I tried dialing 911 a couple more times, but I couldn't even force myself to dial the numbers out. The pain would just come back stronger and stronger. The last time I tried, it felt like my stomach was going to rip open. I could see my chest starting to poke out in random places. I ended up throwing my phone against the wall. My phone was broken. The barista was a nut job and didn't know how to leave. I sat on one of the chairs and looked out the window. A couple of people walked past the window, but every time I tried banging on the window to get them to help, the pain would come back and I would, once again, fall to the ground until it passed. The last thing I remember before I blacked out was the barista walking towards me, grabbing my head, saying, I'm sorry, for the second time, and slamming my head repeatedly against the wall. I woke up to the worst headache I have ever experienced and a whole new set of clothes on my body. I was in the same outfit the barista was wearing, a yellow shirt, blue jeans, white tennis shoes, and a solid green apron with Cafe 1987 written in the middle of it. My name, David, was sewn into the top right corner of the apron, and what seemed to be a small menu sat next to my right hand. Handbook for the Cafe 1987 employees was written on the front of it. Curious, I flipped it open and saw that only one thing was written in the middle of the left page. Today's special is hot cocoa, good for the soul. Will make your warm nights warmer. It will make you feel younger. The right side was completely blank. I slammed it shut and stood next to my new co-worker. I tried to speak to him a few times over the course of the day, but... He never said anything back. He just lifelessly stared at me while I spoke to him. The day ended and the next day came. A new menu would be in my hand every morning. I didn't know where the menu came from. I even tried to stay up all night a couple of times to see who gave us the new menu. But each time, the pain would come back and I would fall asleep as the pain went away. My body started getting weaker. My bones started feeling more fragile. My movements became slower. I knew what was happening to me. My body was getting older. Minutes turned to days, days turned to weeks, and weeks turned to months. I lost track after the eighth month. My body was failing on me. But the other barista was completely fine. He kept drinking the drink of the day. I noticed something squirming around in my body. Sometimes it would be deep inside, mingling with my organs, while other times it would rest on top of my bones. Every time I did something that was deemed against the rules, the pain would come back, and I noticed that it was the cause of the pain. Don't ask me why I didn't die of starvation or thirst. Nothing made sense to me then or even now. I just know that I completely lost it yesterday. The thing was squirming a little more than usual and I could feel every time it would move even an inch. Finally, it rested under the skin of my chest I quickly grabbed a cloth napkin and put it in my mouth. 
I took my wallet out and grabbed my credit card out of my pocket and held it with my left hand. With a muffled scream, I grabbed the skin around the thing and pulled as hard as I could. Pain erupted from my tearing skin, as well as from whatever was in my body. I almost gave up halfway through, but I knew it was the last chance I had to live. I used my left hand to jam the credit card as hard as I could into my chest. After several excruciating seconds, I finally managed to make a tear in my chest. I held the thing down in my chest so it wouldn't be able to slide away and slam the corner of the card into the exposed flesh. Once I got to a sizable gash, I threw the card on the ground and used both of my hands to rip off the rest of the skin around whatever the hell that thing was. As my skin tore free, the thing came with it, and I could finally breathe easy. I quickly got up and watched it slide out from underneath the torn off slab of skin. It was the same colour as the liquid that was in the cup I left on the table. The damn mango smoothie. I looked back at the barista and noticed, for the first time, every part of his exposed skin was moving ever so slightly. I wanted to help him, but I knew it was impossible. Without a second thought, I ran out of the door and didn't stop running until I was a good distance away. I felt something vibrate in my pocket, and I almost had a heart attack right there. I thought it was back inside of me, but it was just my phone. The phone I threw against the wall and broke. Nervously, I answered the phone, and my mom asked where I wanted her to pick me up since it was three hours since she dropped me off. I told her I would take a cab back home. I walked around for about 30 minutes. It felt like it had been an eternity since I was outside, and it felt great. I walked into a McDonald's and walked into a restroom. I looked in the mirror and saw that I was no longer older. I was also wearing the same clothes I was wearing before I went into the cafe. Slowly, I lifted my shirt and saw that my chest was back to normal, except a big circle-shaped scar. I ate a cheeseburger, caught a cab, and sat back while we drove home. We drove past the cafe, and I noticed that everything was the same. The same tables, same uncomfortable chairs, and the same miserable-looking barista. But the sign was different. It was now called Cafe 1988. As the title says, I sold my soul for a dishwasher. It seemed like a solid trade at the time. It was online. A guy was selling it on a local for sale site, and the guy wanted like £200 for it. I don't have that kind of money, and I asked if he'd be willing to go any lower. In a joking manner, he suggested that he'd sell it me for my soul, and even including free shipping and installation. Sweet, sign me right up. He emailed some documents, which I didn't even read. I signed, and the next day, two men showed up and installed it. I was pretty smug, and assumed the guy just needed to get rid of it and had a sense of humour. However, it's since come to light that I may have actually given away my soul. Oh, and souls are real. Who knew? Not me. Being soulless seems to come with a few side effects that have slowly 
would surely begun to impact my daily life. I don't dream anymore. Instead, each and every night, I find myself entering a pool of nothingness that I can't quite describe. I don't really have much passion for anything. Not that I was the most passionate guy around before. I'm what you'd call a go-with-the-flow type of guy. I don't laugh or cry. I'm never happy nor sad, angry or excited. Everything is inconsequential. Nothing has meaning. I just am. Oh, and I can see the dead, which kind of sucks. I first realized I could see the dead when I walked into my apartment and saw a dead guy. He was just standing there, staring at me. It was pretty horrifying, honestly. I don't know how I knew he was dead. It was just an instinctive feeling I got. Plus, he's sometimes slightly transparent, which is a bit of a giveaway. He doesn't really talk to me, either. He just walks around the apartment, looking pretty mad. I guess I would be too. I learnt from a neighbour that he died from a heart attack caused by Viagra, and that the girl had freaked and bailed on him without calling the cops. It took a few weeks for him to be found too, when the apartment began to secrete a rather unique stench. He's still... stiff down there. Naked too. It's uncomfortable, sure, but I don't exactly have the means to move somewhere else. Truthfully, he's kind of a chill dude as far as the dead go. He just looks frustrated all the time, but mostly keeps to himself. Spends a lot of time in the bathroom, staring at himself in the mirror. He leaves when I need to take a dump though, so at least he's considerate. I call him Gary. Besides my ethereal roommate, the dead mostly wander around doing... nothing. They can't really interact with anything, which I guess is pretty dull. There's not as many of them as you might think, because I suppose most of them move on to the next place. They're not all like Gary, either. The vast majority that I've seen have disturbed me beyond measure. Burnt, walking corpses, forever crying out and yelling and screaming in agony. Fathers and mothers following their families, crying out to be noticed, begging to be able to tell their loved ones that they're still with them, but having absolutely no way to do so. The children are the worst. They don't have the means to understand what has happened to them and spend their days wandering the busy streets, reaching out for a helping hand that can't even perceive them. It would be tough to watch, were I not. Well, soulless. Anyway, I decided that it's time to get my soul back. It's more of a principle thing than anything else. I don't like the thought of someone playing with it. Touching it. It grosses me out. Plus, there's the whole eternal damnation thing, which is pretty daunting. The dishwasher has also started leaking and I didn't exactly get a warranty. I hadn't managed to make much headway getting it back. There's not much solid information out there about reclaiming souls, believe it or not. I tried contacting the guy who bought it to see if he accepts refunds. He hasn't replied to my messages, which is a bit of a dick move. Mostly, I've just spent my time browsing the internet and looking for a loophole. No such luck so far, but I'm optimistic. Anyway, last night, I came upon some article on the obviously deepest recesses of the internet, somewhere no living man has ever been. It was about five pages on Google. It was a ritual to summon a demon. A decent starting point, I figured. It's not exactly like I can be dismissive of the supernatural any longer. I won't go into the details, but let's just say that it involved some candles, burning some incense, and offering up a series of foreign spices. I raided my neighbor's spice rack. 
nothing really happened at first. I prepared the summoning as instructed, chanted the words as best as I could. Gary joined me, sitting on the sofa and watching. I wish he'd at least put a towel on before he sat on things. But each time I suggest it, he'd just walk away through a wall or something. There's no sense arguing with some people. Eventually, I gave up, sat down next to Gary, and turned on the TV. We watched some Netflix. I had a beer. Gary stared at his ghostly boner for a while. Not a bad evening. I'd almost forgotten about the entire summoning thing when my apartment burst into a supernova of despair. Green flames roared and licked the ceiling, emerging from an abyss that opened up on my floor. My heart grew still, and my blood ran cold. Not because my landlord made it very clear that any damage to the wall and ceilings was coming straight out of my deposit, but more so because I was immediately filled with a daunting sensation that I had made a huge error in judgement. I may be empty, but the one thing I could still feel was fear, apparently. I suppose it's instinctual, a residual survival instinct left over from when I had been truly alive. A voice emerged from the fire, so deep that I could feel the vibrations weaving through my bones. It was familiar, but utterly alien at the same time. A voice I'd heard a thousand times, but also never at all. My brain immediately informed me that I should be running away from whatever unnatural hellscape I had just welcomed into my home. My knees seized, making that impossible. Filth, crap and filth running over the mountains of flesh and bones and bile. People piled together in pits and hands and arms, outstretched towards the sky. A mass of men and women pulling children, all screaming and begging and crying out, clawing at each other and trying to pull themselves from the pit of their own waist, like maggots festering in a wound. My words caught in my throat, the inside of my mouth drying in an instant. All right, okay, noted. Now, if we could just go back to the issue at hand. There is pain, unimaginable oceans of pain that drag you down into a depth of horror the likes of which the living cannot even begin to comprehend. Voices screaming eternally for mercy from a God who cannot hear them. Parents trample their children, but for an instant of relief from the ceaseless torment. Storms of acid rain down upon the- Yeah, yeah, I got that. Now, I really do have some questions if you have a moment. I get the feeling I won't be able to do this twice. Ask then, mortal but know that words cannot convey the true reality that awaits all that walk the earth. There is no escape. There is no heaven. There is no justice. There is only pain. Yeah, I got that. Well, I guess I just wanted to know how to go about getting my soul back. I kind of feel like I was misled on the whole deal, really. I'm just starting to think there's no union I can really take my concerns to. The fire grew dim for a few moments as though it was pondering over my words. My apartment grew silent. Gary looked at me, bewildered. He apparently deemed what was occurring more important than his eternal erection. You summoned me here, mortal, for such a petty concern as a soul. I, who has forged empires and tempted saints, whose name is forbidden in a thousand worlds for fear that I shall return to reap what is owed, you dare bring me such trifles? The crackling of the flames seemed to turn into more of a taunt from the damned. I could see faces within them, writhing out with mouths outstretched, howling into eternity. Some looked at me with pleading eyes, as though I was a saviour to free them from this misery. Others had no eyes at all. Only he whom has claim over your soul may return it, and only from his own free will. Souls cannot be stolen or claimed. They can only be given freely. 
Okay, that was something I could work with. I stood up, took a few steps back from the flames, cautiously. I hadn't thought about how I was supposed to end this summoning, because I honestly hadn't expect anything to come from it. Hindsight can really bite you, I guess. The laughter grew louder, until it filled what felt like the world. Winds howled outwards, carrying wails with them that each told the tale of a different torment. A few beads of sweat began forming on my brow, my stomach turning into knots. Who holds your soul, I cannot say, mortal. But you have more pressing matters at hand. You may be soulless, but you will still feel every single one of the sweet pleasures that damnation has to offer. You will come with me now and taste the sweet nectar of true suffering. From the black abyss that covered the ground, an outstretched hand emerged, the palm larger than my head. Its skin was ashen grey, cracked with veins of pure fire. The nails were sharp than knives and scratched deep grooves into my wooden floor as the beast pulled itself upwards. You are mine now. You will come with me, willing or not. There is no escape. You will witness firsthand my dominion. I will tear you limb from limb and then reform you whole to experience it all again. Your memories of life will fade and only suffering will... Gary stood from the sofa and walked towards the abyss in all his naked glory. He raised an outstretched hand from which a pillar of light shot forth and almost blinded me. I can still see spots. The beast roared and screamed, its arms shedding into dust and falling into the darkness. The flames withdrew with it, and with a sudden gust, the hole vanished into nothingness. Gary looked at me, shrugged, and walked into the bathroom to stare at himself in the mirror. I didn't ask. So that was yesterday. I've spent the night processing the entire ordeal and figure it's time to start looking. So if anyone knows a guy that trades used appliances for souls, let me know. I'm open to suggestions as well. If anything develops, I'll be sure to let you guys know. For those who aren't in the know, not too long ago I sold my soul for a £200 used dishwasher. This has proved to be a rather irresponsible decision, as I am now a soulless husk who sees the dead. Oh, and the dishwasher has started leaking a weird brown gunk all over my kitchen floor, which kind of sucks. I recently made the decision to reclaim my soul, which has turned out to be kind of tricky. So far, my endeavours have led me to summoning a demon in my apartment who attempted to drag me back to hell and violate me. Don't worry, my naked ghost roommate Gary vanquished him, I think. He has a permanent ghost boner. It's super weird. Anyway, it turns out that the only way to reclaim my soul is to be given it back by the guy who I traded it with. Simple stuff, surely? Not quite. I've been unable to contact him online because the douche is ignoring all of my messages. That pretty much exhausted all of my options, so I decided it better to just embrace the soulless lifestyle. Sure, it has its flaws. I now couldn't leave my apartment without witnessing a parade of deceased souls, and the floorboards inside my apartment, where there had briefly been a portal to hell, now leaks the tears and howls of the damned. But I guess nothing's perfect. I could grow accustomed to the dead, and I'd already covered my floor with a nice new rug that muffled most of the cries of the condemned. Things were looking up. That is, until I made a solid breakthrough in the search for my soul through my exceptional perception, cunning and intuition. The newspaper ad read, Need new stove? Perhaps fridge freezer? Call now. We'll accept best offer. Now accepting souls. It seemed a bit too on the nose to be a coincidence. I made the call, got an address, 
and embarked on my journey of soul reclamation. Gary joined me, and I sensed this was just another average Tuesday for him. Our journey took us to a downtown marketplace. It was early morning, and the place was filled with people setting up stalls of strange meats and fish, novelty decorations, and knockoff clothes. The dead were everywhere. Gary approached the one, a weeping woman who stood in the middle of the walkway. She was dripping wet from head to toe, her skin a strange tint of blue, and her arms slashed from wrist to elbow. He stood in front of her, presenting himself. She stopped weeping, looked Gary up and down, and proceeded to continue weeping whilst walking away. Gary looked like he let out an inaudible sigh. I guess even in death, rejection is hard. Undeterred, he walked over to another. I decided to leave him to it. You do you, Gary. The actual living souls were busy unloading vans and pitching signs, and I wondered where it was that I would begin my search. The call hadn't been very specific on the exact location of this trader of souls, so I'd guessed I'd have to do a bit of legwork. Maybe give a few people the rundown. Maybe play a little good cop bad cop with my spectral sidekick. One thing was certain, it would be a grueling day. Oh, you want Dave? He's right in there. The fish salesman pointed towards a warehouse at the other side of the market handing me back the newspaper clipping I'd given him. The warehouse in question looked deserted, and the only entrance I could find lay down a dingy alleyway, locked with thick, rusted chains. The whole place screamed murder. As I approached the alleyway, a hand grasped my wrist and pulled me back. You don't want to go in there, an old, veiled woman informed me in a thick eastern accent. No good in there, child. Only darkness. Her skin had the feel of dry plastic and was as smooth as sandpaper. Right. I'm actually looking for a guy who has my soul. I hear his name is Dave. She let go of my arm and began taking steps backwards, looking me up and down as she did so. You are... You are unnatural, tainted, no, 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 evil, unclean, you leave, be gone. She began gesturing me away with one hand, another reaching for a talisman around her neck and gripping it tightly. She began hissing, and I got the impression that I wasn't wanted. I continued down the alley. Getting inside proved rather difficult. The door was locked, and as rusted as they were, the chains wouldn't budge. There was a small window overhead, which, after a great deal of exertion and strain, I managed to climb and squeeze through, landing hard on the other side. Gary rejoined me, and just walked right through it. Ahead of me lay a barely lit, stretching hallway. Graffiti stained the walls covered in obscenities and foul depictions of genitals. Smeared next to the doorway, in what I assumed was red paint, were the words, Abandon all hope, dickweeds. A cool wind ran through the length of the hall, and the darkness felt heavy. I looked at Gary, who was busy comparing a detailed depiction of a male member with his own phantom limb. Looking defeated, he walked ahead, a lifetime must have passed whilst we walked that hall. It felt like hours rolled over into days, but at the same time, it felt like no time had passed at all. The way in which we'd entered had long since disappeared into nothingness, and yet we reached no end. The hallway was ceaseless. My eyes adjusted to the darkness as best as they could, but I stumbled occasionally and fell flat on my face more than once. Gary attempted to catch me at one point, but I fell right through him. I appreciated the thought though. 
After a long while, or maybe just a few minutes, I suggested we should probably turn back, and that no good would come from walking down that hallway forever. Gary looked as though he was cool either way, so I took the initiative and began to turn back. There's no escape, a voice whispered from the darkness, everywhere and nowhere. It was soft, almost childlike. You cannot escape eternity. Another voice joined it, it too a whisper, but distinctly deeper and croaked. You will wander this place until the stars bleed out and all light fades from the heavens. A third voice, this one louder and almost taunting, a slight laugh in the tone. Your feet will grind to blood and dust, and even then you will crawl on mangled stubs and still come no closer to salvation. More voices pitched in, as though every speck of darkness was reaching out and singing similar horrors into my mind, a chorus of the macabre and morbid. I'm actually looking for Dave, do you guys know where he is, or... The voices burst into manic giggling and laughter inside my mind, louder than anything I thought possible. My head throbbed with the weight of it all, a few trickles of blood beginning to drop from my nose. I could taste iron in the back of my throat. In synchronicity, they spoke, and each word was an explosion inside my skull. Lost little lamb, cry so we can taste the tears, scream so that we may find bliss in the melody, suffer so that we may make you pure, embrace us. From all around my being, hands outstretched, they gripped clothing and skin and hair, dug into bone and hooked under tendons, pulling and pushing and yanking and splitting and tearing and laughing and screaming and ripping and... Lights turned on overhead, and I found myself writhing on the floor alone. There were no hands, no voices in my head. We were in a large warehouse floor, surrounded by boxes and crates and trucks. Gary stood behind me, still naked as ever. In the center of the floor sat a young guy on a fold-out garden chair. He looked no older than 18 and wore dirty overalls and a black beanie. He waved. Um, hey. I pulled myself to my feet, dusting myself off. That was weird. Yeah, sorry about that. Security system. Cool, right? Had a few too many break-ins lately. He announced, sipping at a thermos. He gestured for me to approach. Are you Dave? I asked, rubbing at my back, which ached fiercely. Yep, that's me. You here for the stove? I got a couple left. Good condition too. Almost new. The next few minutes were spent with me explaining that I wasn't in fact there to purchase a stove, and was in fact trying to get my soul back. I explained that I traded my soul online. He apologized for not responding to my emails, got me a coffee. It tasted like manual labor. He was an alright guy really. He was even willing to trade back my soul for the dishwasher, so long as I paid him a small accounting fee. We settled on 50 pounds which I wasn't too pleased with, but figured it was probably the best deal I was going to get. We shook hands, and he went and fetched the water-damaged box filled with junk and began rustling through it. I know I had it here somewhere. No, not that. No, that's Jimmy's. Where did I... Ah, oh, damn, that's right. He closed the box and scratched his jaw. What's wrong? I asked as he started to pace back and forth. Yeah, bit of an issue, buddy. I traded a whole bunch of souls yesterday, and I think yours was one of them. Feeling slightly displeased at this revelation, I inquired to whom he had given my soul. 
It's, uh, right. I'm not 100% on this, but I'm pretty certain that your soul is now in hell. Yeah, like 99% sure. He went on to explain that he had a regular trade deal with some demon. Dave gave him souls, and the demon gifted Dave with rare antiquities and ungodly security systems. It was apparently a no-go-back kind of trade, and getting it back was pretty much a lost cause. I was beginning to think that I'd wasted the entire Tuesday. Dave, however, advised me that all was not lost. He could simply open a gateway, and we could go and get the soul. This, of course, came with an opening a doorway to hell fee, but Dave assured me that he did in fact accept credit cards. After the payment cleared, Dave went about drawing all sorts of chalk symbols on the wall to the warehouse floor, each appearing to be from a different language that I imagine nobody has spoken for a very long time. When that was finished, he smeared an odd scarlet liquid across the symbols that he got from a jar, and coupled this with a brief reading of scripture. Gary wandered around, and I did a Sudoku. Right, that's that. Now we wait, Dave announced, his hand on his hips. He looked quite pleased with himself, and frowned for a moment and licked his thumb. Rubbed a little bit of chalk from the wall, and then returned to looking pleased. It should open any minute now. We waited for seven hours. Dave filled me in on the whole soul trade business and how he'd gotten into it from his grandma and was trying to bring the industry into the 21st century. He'd only been doing it for a couple of months, but things were on the up and up. He was even thinking about setting up his own website. So, does your friend wear clothes or is that a stylistic choice? Oh yeah, that's Gary, I muttered, taken aback. You can see him? Clear as day, so He nodded. Gary nodded back. I got the sight, as my grandma used to say. Spooky stuff. Right, well, I'm not sure I... A low groan emerged from the wall, like the bricks themselves were in pain. I put down the coffee I'd been nursing. Dave jumped to his feet, elated. Yes, finally! Small fissures began to appear in the brick, cracking like outstretched veins. From them, a thin fog began to seep outwards. The lights overhead flickered, and instantaneously erupted into a shower of sparks and glass. You've done this before, right? I asked. The fog sank from the cracks and began flowing across the ground. Chips of brick began to crumble, and the groan grew louder still. Oh yeah, tons of times. They've had to shout at this point just to be heard over the ceaseless din of the opening gateway. Well, maybe not success. The world as I knew it exploded. The wall erupted outwards, sending chunks of brick and concrete flying. Dave flew with it. Dust and rubble and blood sprang from where he had been standing. Where there had once been a wall, a gaping hole into nothingness now stood. A swirling vortex of foreboding darkness. The air all around began to move towards it, like water down a plug hole. The ground beneath my feet was gone before I knew what was happening, and I found myself falling through the air towards the vortex's gaping maw. I was pulled ever inward swirling and screaming and howling into the madness of it all. And then I wasn't. I was on the floor, in the warehouse, where I'd been only moments ago. For the second time, I stood and brushed myself off, and coughed up what nine out of ten doctors would call a concerning amount of blood. Disoriented, I reached for my coffee and took a sip, which I immediately spat across the ground. It tasted like crap, like actual feces. I threw the cup on the ground and looked around. Yeah, I was still in the warehouse, but everything seemed slightly off. 
The walls that had once been slightly dirty were now layered in a thick coat of rust. The air was heavy and dense, and the ground was coated in a fog that had seeped through the walls earlier. The gateway was gone, and the wall that stood where it had been was coated in all manner of filth. I could see my breath escape my lips, and my whole body shivered in the cold. Shadows darted around the peripheral of my vision, and the groan that I had heard earlier was now a steady hum in the distance. Ever so faintly in the distance, I could hear screaming. Gary stood beside me. I swallowed hard. The only comfort I could find in the moment was that Gary looked as disinterested as ever. He began to walk forward, and I followed. I descended into hell, guided by my own fully erect Virgil. I'm sorry if any of this seems confusing. To be honest, it is not easy to explain the concept of multiple universes. The only way I can elaborate is this. Before you make any decision, think about the possible consequences of your actions. This, of course, can result in multiple outcomes as there are hundreds of outside factors impacting your life at any given time. Now, think about all the possible realities that could exist based off of people's decisions. Most people don't think about this concept much since it doesn't affect them. I am a bit of an exception to this rule. To tell you the truth, I thought they were all dreams at first. I have a tendency to dream in third person about everyday occurrences. Sometimes I dream about running errands, eating, talking with friends, the usual stuff. A lot of the times, it feels like I'm watching an incredibly boring movie about someone else's life, and that is the odd part. Even though I realize that I'm dreaming about myself, it never really seems like I am the one experiencing those events. It always has this disconnected quality to it, like watching someone else's life. I really didn't think much about it. I just assumed that that was how some people dreamed. Some people dreamed in black and white. Some have completely off the wall and nonsensical experiences. A few people dream only once in a blue moon. Others dream about something every night. I just saw my dreams in third person. It felt like there was nothing out of the ordinary happening so I never really tried to come up with a conclusion to all of this. I realized I was seeing parallel realities when I was 13 years old. I was involved in a car accident with my parents. We were driving home after a vacation and having an argument about something stupid. I wanted to go to a concert for my 14th birthday and they didn't think I was old enough. I kept pressing the issue and telling them my friends would be going and that I was mature enough. I realized I was going to lose this argument due to the fact that I had been caught smoking a few days earlier, but I kept arguing and whining about how it wasn't fair that they could go and I couldn't. It was while my father was turned around to tell me that their decision was final that the man stepped into the street in front of our car. Everything happened in the blink of an eye, but the scene still feels fresh in my mind, like a snapshot. The man was rough looking, his hair was scraggly and greasy looking, his clothes looked like the kind of stuff you'd find at a goodwill donation store. He had one arm in front of his face to shield his eyes from my headlights. He was likely homeless and walking to a shelter that was off one of the highway exits when he stepped into the path of our car. I cried out just in time for my dad to look forward 
and see the man in front of our speeding car. He cranked the wheel to the left and just narrowly missed running over the man. The sudden change of directions made the car lose control. We swerved left and right as my dad tried to steady the wheel before we slammed into the concrete median. We had been too busy arguing from the last rest stop and my parents forgot to put on their seatbelts. The car slammed into the median about 60 miles an hour. The impact crumpled the front of the car like an empty soda can. The crash catapulted my mom through the windshield and into the median while it threw my dad face first into the windshield. I slammed my head into the back of the passenger seat and my vision exploded in a hot stinging flash that felt like someone had driven a hot poker into my brain. My mom's death was instantaneous while my dad died slowly. Sometimes I lie to myself and pretend the impact with the back of the seat knocked me out. It didn't. I remember lying there with the world strobing, monochromatic and dull, hearing the sound of my father gurgle through the glass that was embedded in his upper body. I smelled smoke and tasted copper. My last coherent memory of the accident was the sound of the car engine slowly stalling and stopping while my dad tried to scream through a broken jaw and deflated lung. I slipped into unconsciousness just as my father stopped crying out. I was technically in a coma for three days, but it didn't feel like it. Instead, it felt like I was watching a slideshow of different events and scenes. Each felt like an out-of-body experience that I drifted in and out of. One in particular stuck out. It was a concert surrounded by people. It was so real that I felt myself being drawn into it. I pretended that this was reality and the car accident was just a dream. I drifted towards myself and made contact. In that split moment, I could almost feel the heat radiating off the bodies around me. I could smell the smoke and sweat. The music pumping from the speakers made my clothes vibrate. In that moment, it felt real. Then I woke up. I came to in a hospital bed. I gagged and desperately clawed at the endotracheal tube. Someone quickly rushed over and through the haze, I couldn't make out any of their facial features. As the fog of my mind lifted, I saw a nurse step into view and up to my bed. She held my hands and removed the tube. I remember gagging and sputtering for a few minutes more before I was able to croak out the word, parents. The nurse's look said it all, and I broke down. With nothing to do in the hospital and no one to visit me, I found myself sleeping a lot. Each time I tried to go back to that dream of the concert, but I never relived that event. Sometimes I was watching myself eat dinner with family, other times I was dropping subtle hints about what I wanted for my birthday. One time I was holding a puppy close to me and scratching her behind the ears as she tried to lick my hand. These were all things that were lost to me. Without any real family or close friends to take care of me, I became a ward of the state. I had spent three weeks in the hospital when I first decided to cross over. I was 14 and getting ready to be discharged from the hospital to be sent to a home for a wayward youth. It was not an exciting prospect. I wanted to escape. I wanted to get away. My dreams were the only option that was available to me. If I could somehow manage to experience that moment from the concert, 
I was certain I could do it. All I needed to do was find it and hold on for dear life. I managed to escape two days before I was set to be discharged. I had just drifted off when I found myself hovering over my body. He was reading a book in his room. I drew closer and reached out to him. Just as I touched him, he winced and his hand went to his forehead like he was experiencing a painful headache. The sensations came rushing to me. I could feel the warmth of the bed. I could smell the cigarette he had smoked out of the window earlier. I felt an incredible resistance, but I kept pushing forward. I could taste the tarry feeling that was still in his mouth. I kept going. I heard him scream in agony. I didn't stop. Just as quickly as the resistance began, it ended. We fell to the floor and a sudden loss of consciousness overtook us. There was only silence for a few minutes before I was pulled out of it by someone frantically shaking me. I opened my eyes to see his mother and father kneeling around me with a concerned look on their face. I asked the only thing that could come to mind. What happened? You fainted like back then. We need to get you checked out. I answered. No, I just stood up too fast and felt faint. It's nothing to be worried about. I tried to explain it away, but we still ended up going to the doctor's office the next day. We were awake the entire night. They were afraid to let me fall asleep, and I was in a state of shock over everything that had happened. I could hardly believe that I was in a different body and a different reality. I can't explain the feeling other than describing it like an extreme moment of awkwardness after doing something supremely embarrassing where you feel everyone's eyes on you and you feel uncomfortable in your own skin. The doctors found nothing wrong with me and I was given a clean bill of health. Hearing those words were what my parents needed to hear. They stepped across the room and wrapped their arms around me. It happened so suddenly that I didn't have time to prepare. The memories rushed over me and swallowed me up. I remembered my parents. My last words to them were terrible. I wish I could remember what I said. I wish I could take back every single word. Instead, I remembered the accident. I recalled the sound of glass breaking and the sudden impact. I re-experienced the sound of my father crying out in agony. I hugged his parents closely and wept into their shoulders. They cried tears of relief while I was reliving the most traumatizing moment in my life. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was happening and I think this is the best way to explain it. Imagine that you are trying to decide whether to go into work one day or not. Regardless of your choice, there exists a separate reality where you decide to do something else. From there, there are multiple possibilities and outcomes. Maybe you get a promotion for your hard work, or maybe you get caught playing hockey and are fired. Maybe your co-workers are none the wiser and you end up running into the love of your life on your free day. Or maybe you decided to go into work and had such a rough day that you snap and staple your boss's stupid polka dot tie to his face. Suffice it to say, even the smallest decision can fragment reality and produce dozens of alternate worlds that are drastically different. You could be happily married in one, destitute and jobless in another, or on the run from the law with the least intimidating fugitive name ever known to man, Stapling Sammy, all due to a seemingly simple choice. This is a bit of an oversimplification, 
but it covers the gist of it. You can't even begin to consider the hundreds of thousands of possibilities that this theory births in a single day. After figuring out what had happened, I decided to explore this person's life. How similar were we to each other? I reasoned that I would only stay here for a few days before moving on. I didn't want to steal his life. I just wanted a few moments for myself before I'd return to my reality. I could likely go back to my own reality by going to bed and trying to sift through all the variations until I came across my own. It was only something I wanted to do before I went back. I wanted to see the other world. I still saw the lives of the various other versions of me when I slept, so I figured I could leave and return to my original body anytime I wanted by scouring through the multiple realities to find the original existence. I wanted to experience this other me's life for a while before I did that. I wanted to know what it was like to live with his parents just for a few more days. I ended up spending two months in that body. I assumed that when I left his body, he would return to the forepoint of his consciousness and assume his life as if nothing had happened. In the end, it was the awkwardness that forced me to leave. I was happy for a while in that body. The main problem was that this wasn't my reality. Some of the major events were the same, but others were completely new. This version of me had met new friends and experienced things that were completely foreign to me. My friends would drop jokes that were between us, which were lost on me. My parents would recall events that I never experienced or knew about. After about two months of feigning friendships and pretending to recall memories, I decided that I needed to leave. I didn't return to my reality, however. I found a new body to inhabit. I didn't want to go back to my reality. I didn't want to wake up every morning with a hole in my life, in a place that wasn't my home. I didn't have a home. As I dreamt, I looked for a new life. I eventually found a new reality. That version of me had just pulled away from kissing a pretty girl at a park. Their eyes were half closed and they had beatific smiles stretched across their faces. I watched as they whispered sweet nothings to each other out under the stars. They eventually parted ways and he walked home. I waited until he was sneaking back into the house to step into his reality. He fought back like the other versions of me did, but by now I had gotten the hang of it. I pressed forward and drove him back into the recesses of his mind. He didn't even get a chance to scream before I broke through the resistance and took over. I stood and tested out my motor functions. I was in complete control. The invasion took it out of me, so I searched the house for my bedroom and immediately collapsed into bed. In that brief moment, I was happy that I had come into this life. That happiness was short-lived. We broke up quickly after that. We had about a week together of ignored inside jokes and missed memories before Myra dumped me. She had told me that I had changed, which was true. The person she loved had changed the moment I stepped into the driver's seat. I technically wasn't the person she had fallen for. Despite only knowing her for about a week, losing her hit me harder than I'd expect. I think the worst part was that I actually did like her. Like all first loves, I thought that it was something pure, that it was eternal. I treated the loss of her like I had missed my only chance at love. I sank into a funk after the breakup. I spent a few days in a room that wasn't technically my room, listening to the saddest music I could find, 
crying over Myra, a girl that never really even knew me. I was miserable. I spent a long time wallowing in self-pity before I decided that I needed to get over her. To this day, I still regret the decision I made. I decided that I needed to occupy a happier life. I really didn't look where I leaped. I only wanted away from where I was. I must have jumped between dozens of bodies within a week. Sometimes I wouldn't even spend an hour inside a person's head before I decided that there was probably someone better out there. Out in the wild expanse of dreams lied a person who would be able to make me genuinely happy. I would keep searching until I found that person who was leading a perfect little life that I could borrow from them. As time passed, my abilities to jump into other consciousnesses became second nature. Not to be boastful, but the hardest part was actually getting to sleep sometimes. I would shift into a new body and see what kind of life this other version of me had. If I liked it, I would stay. If I didn't, I would find a place to sleep and shift immediately. At first, it started out like an adventure. Every shift brought a new life and new experience. But slowly, that feeling of excitement began to slow off its skin and reveal the rot underneath. I tried to chase that excitement by shifting realities more often, but that only brought boredom. I cycled through dozens of lives, so many that I actually lost count. It became a mundane and trivial thing. I didn't realize why this feeling of boredom had taken over such a wonderful gift until a few months had passed and the realization dawned on me like a bolt from the blue. I was unhappy with these experiences because they weren't my own. I could play pretend in all of these bodies, but at the end of the day, I would still be that lonely, scared orphan in a new and frightening place. It was on the break of that revelation when I made the worst discovery. I came across one of the previous bodies I inhabited. I don't know exactly how I identified it as being a version of me that I previously inhabited. It was just this odd feeling of familiarity, like I had been here before. Something just told me that I had stepped into this person's consciousness and that they were in this condition because of me. I hovered over them as the respirator rasped and breathed for him. The EKG beeped out a steady rhythm, its sound being the only thing that told me this version of me was still alive. He laid motionless in the hospital bed with his eyelids taped shut. There were so many tubes in him, each one carried out his bodily functions. He had a tube to breathe, one to provide nutrients, and even another to aid him in voiding himself. His life had been reduced to nothing but a series of tubes, carrying out body necessities for a life he could no longer enjoy. This person was brain dead, and I was the cause of his condition. I thought that shifting into their bodies was harmless, and that I was only experiencing their life for a while before returning it to them. But that couldn't be further from the truth. I wasn't pushing them to the back of their mind while I assumed the helm. I was ejecting them completely from their brain and leaving their body behind. I tried to enter their mind to see if there was any glimmer of them left. But there was nothing. There was no resistance. It was like stepping into a dark room and feeling all along the perimeter for a light switch, but finding nothing. There was nothing here. I couldn't step back into the controls. This person was irrevocably gone. I woke up after that and just laid in this other version of me's bed for hours. 
The thought that I had been doing this for months to multiple people made me sick. I tried to remember how many realities I had shifted into, how many versions of me I had rendered catatonic, but I couldn't. There were too many to count. Even the body I was in at the time would be doomed to the same fate as the others if I left. Would his family find him in time to get him to a hospital when I left? Or would his organs slowly shut down until he stopped breathing and died? I thought about returning to my original body and vowing to never shift to another reality. But I realized how hopeless that all was. Even if I could manage to sift through the millions of alternate realities to find my original one, what chance did I have of returning to my body and continuing my life? Was there anything I could even return to? Could I even reassume control of my body, which had been lacking a consciousness for so long? How long had my body been brain dead in that hospital bed? How would I reassume control when I couldn't shift into the bodies of the comatose? I was stuck here. I decided that I would stay in this body, for better or worse. I spent about three months in this person's life, before the migraine started. The pain came in debilitating waves. One moment I was fine and trying to adjust to this new environment, and the next I was on my knees with my fists pressed into my temples in an attempt to quell the agony. It felt like my brain was a bundle of nerves that was wrapped in a sheet of constantly constricting razor wire. It didn't take long for the paranoia to settle in. What was causing this pain? Was it me slowly losing my hold over this body? I never attempted to stay inside a body for longer than two months, so was it even possible to indefinitely occupy a body? Or was it something worse? Was it someone else trying to evade this reality? It was possible. There were thousands of alternate realities out there. Who is it to say that there wasn't someone out there with the same ability? The physical symptoms mirrored that of consciousnesses I had taken over. The terrifying thought of my mind being ejected and this body slowly atrophying and rotting drove me to do the unthinkable. I started shifting realities again. Driven by paranoia, the will to survive, and the fear of dissolution, I shifted. The version of me I chose to control was studying for an AP biology exam in his room when I invaded. Enough time had passed to the point where I thought the worst was behind me. I convinced myself that it was a singular event and that it wouldn't happen again. But soon enough, the pain returned in all its blinding fury. I would move to a new reality as soon as the migraines caught up with me. No matter what happened, the pain always returned. Now, it was a permanent fixture of my shifting. I would get a brief reprieve from the headaches with every new body. But sooner or later, the migraines would always come back. Dark thoughts buzzed through me while all of this was going on. Could it happen to me? A teenager listening to music in their room? What would happen if I lost hold over my body? A student sitting in a parking lot trying to psych themselves up to ask a girl to prom? Would my spirit linger in that place for all eternity without a body to enter and a place to go? A version of me that was rehearsing a graduation speech. What happened to all the consciousnesses that I forced out and all the bodies I left behind? A teenager poring over websites for prospect colleges. It was either them or me, and I wanted to survive at all costs. I didn't even notice that the time between headaches was less and less. What had started as a refractory period of three months slowly began to decrease. Soon it had gone for three months, then two, then to one. It was so slight a change at first that I didn't realize it 
until the time between the migraines was only a few weeks. It was an imperceptible difference that I actually sat down and started counting down the days between episodes. I dropped from 3 weeks to 8 days to 11. Now it's only a week before the excruciating migraines return. I'm running out of time. How long is it until I'm trapped? Will the time I have left drop down to mere hours? How many people will I sacrifice to steal a few more precious hours? A part of me knows I have to end this, and another part of me wants to shift realities until there is no one left to take over. I need to end this before the desire to survive overrides any sense of morality I have left. The pain is so intense that it blasts out all other thoughts from my mind. When the headache sets in, I can only think of escaping the searing pain. I still dream of other realities when I sleep, and that's the problem. The ability to switch realities is still there, and the urge to buy myself a little more time at the cost of other people is still there. I know I will succumb to the pain and try to escape it when it returns. I have become a vampire of time, but that ends tonight. I was 14 when I first killed my original body by trying to run away from my own reality. I'll be 20 when I kill myself for the final time. In an odd twist of fate, I find myself writing this in the body of a suicidal version of me. I watched him in the darkened room as he held a knife to his wrist. There are letters all around him from various colleges that had been hastily torn open. Their contents were crumbled on the floor of his room. The sense of rejection and hopelessness encompassed the room. He stared at the knife, pressed against his wrist for a couple minutes before I stepped in. He wanted to kill himself, but suicide is an absolute. There is no turning back from that. It would make anyone hesitate. I just gave him the push that he needed. Oddly enough, he fought the most to survive. The others crumbled away under my mental assault and were exiled from their bodies in the space of a minute. He gave his all, trying to force me out of his mind, but I was too determined. I needed a brief respite from the migraines to get my thoughts in order and to steal myself for what I had to do to escape my rapidly approaching fate. I had to write out my final message. It took 15 minutes, but his will eventually broke under my assault and I ejected him out into the ether. He would be my last victim. I only needed a few hours free from the crushing headache to write all this before I gave him the death he wanted so badly. I have to do this. So many lives. So many unlived lives. So many parents finding their children's corpses after I abandoned their world. Left wanting answers they can't find. Lives effectively ruined. This is the only way I can think of to stop myself. If I'm dead, I won't have that option to shift anymore. I think the worst thing about all of this is that while I have this moment of clarity where I'm free from the debilitating pain, I know what I'm doing is one of my only options. However, if the pain were to return, as it likely will in a few days, I would shift bodies in an instant to escape that agony. I would sacrifice another person just to buy myself a few more hours. On to why I'm writing this. I can only hope that there is some converging point in all of our timelines, and somewhere out there are multiple versions of me writing out these same words. Maybe some will convince themselves it's some ridiculous dream that has to be told to someone, or a story that needs to be written out. 
Maybe it'll give some unpardonable explanation to the hundreds of parents I left alone in the world with their catatonic, brain-dead children. I don't deserve to be able to write this, but I'm afraid of dying alone. Ever since I first lost my parents, I've been alone. I tried to substitute it with new lives and new possibilities, but that only made the hollow feeling in my chest but that only made the hollow feeling in my chest grow. I'm terrified of that moment when I have to realize that I can't escape my lot in life. I want someone to know I existed. I want someone to know what I have done. I want someone to know why I have done all of this. And I need people to know why I'm doing this next part. I'm so sorry. I don't have much time to explain. You have to hear me out urgently. It's very important that you do so. I have, for the past couple of weeks, heard of something being passed around on the internet. A simple message that you will stumble upon when you least expect it. According to the people that have been passing around the rumours, when you receive this message, you will die soon after reading, frozen with an intense look of horror upon your face, staring with clouded eyes at whatever attacked you. As any sane person would, I believed all this to be nonsense, as to you. According to rumours, the message is similar to a virus. Unlike its more devious counterparts, the message spreads one thing. Death. Apparently, it's quite structured and concise, seemingly innocent. Some have hypothesised that the message has a consciousness as odd as that sounds. That it is an entity roaming about the internet looking for human prey. It can take many forms, a post on a social forum, perhaps being read out in a video. It may even be posing as an innocent story intended to entertain or scare readers. What's so brilliant about the message is the fact that you rarely realise you've stumbled upon it. It lures you in like prey, tricking you by conveying a feeling of trust, creating this immediate partnership with the narrator that they are looking out for you. This is not the case. You may be a quarter of the way through the message already and not even realise it. And even when you do finally catch on to what's happening, you won't leave. You can't leave, because there is some fundamental belief in humans that these things can't be real. That these demonic entities only exist in the imagination, in movies and horror films. Even those more switched on than the rest, those who catch on quickly, will still remain regardless, despite the warnings. The entity has adapted itself to the human world you see. It has listened, watched, and taken in everything around it. Regarding the behaviour of its prey, what do they fear? Who do they seek? What are their weaknesses? An attempt to form the greatest means of killing humans it could muster. And it succeeded. The internet. What better place? Millions of people tune in every day on their phones, computers, laptops. And humans are stupid as well. Stupid because they won't believe in such things. They have been raised in such a way to regard anything paranormal as make-belief. Like fools, they will pass around the demonic message to each other, showing their friends how weird or cool it is. After all, why should you fear something? if you do not believe in it. It would blend in perfectly as well. Think of it, a message 
that has comments like all the rest, perhaps even a rating. A post that has likes from humans expressing their enthusiasm for it. A video that perhaps seems like any other, with a narrator that is unwittingly dooming listeners and themselves. The prey will idiotically create the perfect disguise in this way, aiding the demonic entity in its efforts. The message itself even uses language devices to attract the prey, similar to how a carnivorous plant may draw a fly to its death. Devices such as reverse psychology are used in the title. The fact that the narrator feigns fear or panic in the first opening sentences to intrigue. As the message continues, the humans will realize that the narrator is in fact the malicious entity they had heard about. You must have realized by now that this is the message. Will you leave the page? No, you won't. That's what's so fiendishly brilliant about it. A little bit more to go, and you're all powerless to leave. Powerless to stop your eyes passing from word to word. You see, there's no way humans can resist the urge to find out how this message will conclude. Even afterwards, you may still refuse to believe, will still cast away any fearful thoughts. This can't be real. These things are never real. It's just designed to frighten me. You've been occupied now for approximately three minutes. During that time, you have licked your lips subconsciously once, wiped your brow, even scratched an itch on the back of your neck. You didn't notice you had done all this, but I did. How? Because I have left out one big gap in the story. What is it that kills you? The message itself? Oh no, the message is a distraction. You don't notice things when you are so captivated by something. Your scratches and itches are one thing, but did you not see your door open briefly? Did you not hear that rustle as someone slid into your room? It has already moved into position, just out of sight, and has been watching your movements for a while. You have until you turn off your computer, then it will attack. Oh, and feel free to warn others about this, not that they'll listen. Seeing a warning that reads, leave the page now, will just spark further curiosity. Late one night, I found myself driving down what seemed like an endless stretch of road. I was on my way back from a week-long business trip, facing at least a 12-hour drive. Having always been afraid of planes and heights in general, the monotonous trek was unavoidable. Though tedious and sometimes downright soul-crushing, I'd grown used to the lonely road trips back and forth from state to state. In an effort to minimize my time behind the wheel, I usually refrained from making pit stops. I would push through exhaustion and discomfort, making my way home in one fell swoop. I would then enter my bedroom and meet my blankets with a hard thud, falling asleep almost immediately after my head hit the pillow. Picturing my eventual slumber is what kept my foot on the gas pedal. On this drive, however, I grew particularly hungry. I tried to ignore the feeling, but this became increasingly difficult as the night went on. I found myself longing for sustenance, fantasizing about dreadful gas station food, anything that would placate my insatiable late night hunger. I was between a rock and a hard place, as tightly squished as one could be. Unable to fight off the urge to eat any longer, 
I gave in to my stomach's groaning and got off the highway somewhere in Massachusetts. I had been to the state on several occasions, but this time I was in unfamiliar territory. There were many trees, more than the average Capeside town. On top of that, there were no buildings in sight. Despite the lack of residential growth, I was sure I could sniff out a 7-Eleven and indulge in a microwave burrito or a slice of rubbery pizza. I drove on for what must have been 30 minutes or so. No gas stations, no fast food joints, no buildings of any kind. Just miles and miles of wooded area. Worst of all, I didn't even have a phone signal to pull up my GPS. I was just about to give up on Operation Midnight Snack when I saw a faint glow off in the distance. This signaled to me that I must have reached the outskirts of civilization. Furthermore, it meant nourishment was just around the corner. As I approached the glimmering light, I realized it was that of a large neon sign. Coming closer, I was able to make out what it said. Supernova Diner followed by an even larger subheading, open 25 hours a day. I guess they really wanted to drive the we never close angle home, and in a cheeky manner no less. Cheekier and larger still, there was a big flashing arrow beneath the sign, pointing to the diner in question. Hungry as ever, I pulled in without hesitation. I jumped out of my car, and rushed towards the entrance, but not before taking a quick look at the place. It was a beautiful, retro-themed silver boxcar diner. The smooth metal exterior gleamed in the moonlight as I walked up. It was so sleek and well-crafted that I wondered why it was located in the middle of nowhere. Could they really get by on the odd passerby here and there? After admiring the diner's craftsmanship, I barged in, intent on satisfying my late night case of the munchies. The diner was void of life, but I heard a voice yell out from the kitchen. Be right there. While I waited for service, I surveyed my surroundings. A gorgeous red checkerboard pattern painted the interior of the building, lined the perimeter with red booths and tables so immaculate they looked as though they'd never been touched by human hands. To top it all off, there was a row of similarly red, identical, cushioned bar stools at the counter. The diner definitely had a classic 50s vibe to it, but it was too crisp and clean to feel truly authentic. After a few minutes of waiting, a middle-aged man came out of the kitchen drying his hands with a dish rag. Hello there, welcome to the Supernova Diner. My name is Hank, and I'll be your server tonight. How can I help you? Hank wore a retro soda jerk cap and a comically large bow tie, a spotless white apron, and a smile almost too wide for his face. He pointed up at the large menu on the wall behind him, where I noticed quirky food items like the Milky Way Shake, Galaxy Sliders, and Planet Fries. Yeah, I'll have whatever the special is. I didn't feel like asking him to translate the menu for me. Plus, I didn't really care what I was eating, as long as my stomach stopped growling. A Nebula Express, coming right up. Hank shot me another awkwardly wide smile. To escape his eager glare, I pulled out my phone and looked at the screen. Still no signal, but I noticed that it was just approaching midnight. I groaned a bit, knowing that my detour has cost me a swift return home. Still, I knew I couldn't ignore my biological needs any longer. I would have ended up stopping at some point anyway. I put my phone in my pocket and looked back up at the counter. Hank was still there, smiling away. Uh, 
shouldn't you be getting my order? He didn't react to my query. Instead, he remained silent and motionless. Okay then, I'm gonna leave now. Bye. Just as I turn around to head for the door, Hank spoke up. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why is that? I asked. Well, it'll be a waste of time. I turned back and glared at him. What are you talking about? Are you going to get my food or not? He laughed at me. You can't leave now. The fun is just about to begin. Your order is being prepared as we speak. Just sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Hank pulled out a stopwatch from his apron. The digital readout appeared to be counting backwards from an hour. I didn't know if it was a restaurant gimmick or a strange prank at my expense. But either way, I was fed up. Bye, Hank. It's been weird. Thanks for nothing. I turned around and continued marching towards the exit. As I did this, my jaw dropped. The door was gone. My eyes quickly darted from left to right, revealing to me that the windows had vanished as well. There was nothing but continuous wall on either side of me. Perplexed, I looked back to Hank. He chuckled to himself, then asked me a question. So, how do you like your meat? What? I asked, completely dazed. Your meat, how do you like it? Um, well done? I like it well done. Well done, huh? I like my meat as red as possible. A little color does the body good. I looked at him, confused. Hank, where's the door? Well, let's just say it's temporarily unavailable. Anything else I can help you with? Yeah, what the hell is going on here? Well, there are a number of possibilities. I've outlined them here on the menu. Hank pointed up at the menu again. Only this time, the food items were gone. The letters had seemingly been rearranged to form bullet points numbered 1 to 3. I read them aloud. 1. During your business trip, one of your colleagues slipped you some LSD as a part of a half-hearted practical joke. What you are experiencing now is a product of the drug's potent hallucinogenic properties. I like that one, Hank said. Unlikely, but it's fun, wouldn't you say? I moved on to the next possibility. Two, you fell asleep at the wheel. This is merely a vivid dream that will continue until you inevitably crash your car and die an impact. Alternatively, you may have already crashed your car and lived, albeit barely. You are currently in a coma and your sleeping mind has formed a narrative based on the hunger you felt before the accident. The dino is a metaphor for the coma itself, and you won't escape until you awaken, which may very well be never. Hank bore a look of concern. A little morbid, I admit, but it is possible. I reluctantly looked at the last option. Three. Something supernatural is afoot. Mysterious forces beyond your comprehension are at play, trapping you in an otherwise normal eatery. These forces will not allow you to leave under any circumstances. The best thing you can do is accept this and allow yourself to succumb to whatever classic paranormal tropes are thrown your way. Death will be your only escape. That's all I could come up with, Hank said. I'm not sure myself, but I'm leaning towards number three. What the hell, Hank? What the hell is this? And shouldn't you, of all people, know? 
You would think so, wouldn't you? But I guess I wouldn't tell you if I did now, would I? He offered me another one of his smiles as a consolation. I wanted to punch it clean off his face. Instead, I partook in a nervous breakdown of sorts. I slammed my body up against the wall where the door used to be. I screamed at the top of my lungs and even grabbed each and every one of the barstools and tossed them in different directions as hard as my arms would allow. All the while, Hank remained calm and still, his lips stretched from ear to ear. Just as I was about to take a swing at him, the kitchen door behind him popped open. Oh, your order must be ready. Please, come with me. Hank disappeared into the darkness beyond the kitchen storeframe. I stayed behind, hesitant to follow him. After a few moments, I heard him yell out to me. Come on, kid. Aren't you hungry? It's true. I was hungry. But I was more so cautious especially given my peculiar situation. Because of this, I sat down in one of the booths and waited. I didn't know what I was waiting for exactly, but it was all I could bring myself to do at that very moment. It wasn't long before I heard Hank's voice again. You can't wait out there forever, kid. As if in response to his statement, the lights in the diner began to flicker. Then, one by one, they went out, spreading darkness from booth to booth. Eventually, I was left with just one bulb above me, wavering in and out of life. It provided me with just enough light to make my way to the kitchen, and Hank knew it. I had two options, go to the dark kitchen, or let the bulb go out and sit in the dark diner. Neither option was ideal, but deep down, I knew only one had the potential to lead me to answers. No matter which one of the far-fetched scenarios on the menu was true. As such, I gave in to the narrative that was unfolding around me. It was clear to me at this point that fighting it was futile. As I passed the threshold into the kitchen, the door shut itself behind me. A bright light poured out from the ceiling, washing over the entire room, revealing vibrant white walls and flooring. In the center of the room was a chair, slanted in a diagonal position, not unlike one you'd find in a dentist's office. Next to the chair was Hank, who had seemingly traded his diner uniform for a flashy white lab coat. Finally, come, sit down, take a load off. If only out of fear for what might happen next if I disobeyed, I did as Hank told me. It's not like I had much of a choice at that point. I slowly walked over to the chair and laid down. As I did this, leather straps wrapped themselves around my legs arms and forehead. I no longer had the luxury of movement or peripheral vision. Hank walked around to the front of the chair and pulled out his stopwatch. You're doing fine kid, only 40 minutes left. Without warning, six or seven shadowy figures came rushing over from either side of me. They brought with them rolling carts filled with what looked like medical equipment and power tools. I tried to make out even a single face in the crowd, but I could not. They lacked discernible features of any kind and moved about in perfect harmony with one another, like animated silhouettes doing the bidding of some unseen higher power. Over the course of the next few minutes, the figures poked and prodded me, drew blood, took hair samples, and inserted their utensils in places I'd rather not discuss. As much as I squirmed and screamed, none of them reacted, not even Hank. Feeling helpless, 
I eventually stopped struggling and simply braced myself for each needle that penetrated my skin. It made things a little more tolerable. After a while, the figures stopped. Instead of going away like I hoped they would, they traded their needles and test tubes for surgical scissors and began cutting my clothes off of me. This continued until I was completely naked. I tried talking with Hank, but he was too busy playing around with samples that had been collected. Even if he did respond, no amount of encouragement could have prepared me for what happened next. Using nothing but scalpels and brute strength, the figures began cutting away at my skin. It was an absolutely horrific orchestra of deadly incisions, and one that continued until I peeled off every last bit of my epidermis. For one reason or another, I remained both alive and awake during the entire ordeal, though at the time, I wished I could have died. The pain was excruciating and came in waves. Just when I thought I was going numb, another unbearable, sharp, throbbing sensation would overtake my entire body. I never felt anything like it before. By the end of it, my ears were ringing from the volume of my own screams. There is that color, Hank exclaimed, gazing at the bloody mess that I'd become. Why are you doing this? I yelled. I'm not doing anything, kid. I'm just here to observe. Relax, only 27 minutes left. I would have argued with him further, but the fingers grabbed the power tools and started tearing through my muscle tissue. The buzzing sound of sores filled the room, drowning out my cries of agony. Through blood-soaked eyes, I could see Hank mouthing the words, tick, tock, tick, tock, over and over again. I watched him mock me until the buzzing stopped and the next stage of torture commenced. I never wanted to see my organs. I never wanted to see my bone. I could have gone my whole life without knowing what they looked like. Now, I can't get the image of them out of my head. I'm afraid I never will. After successfully ripping apart my skin and muscle, the shadowy demons took hammers to my insides, smashing up my spleen, stomach, liver, kidneys and lungs. They broke through the brittle white ivory that made up my skeleton, making sure to leave no bone unturned. They even destroyed my skull and scooped up my brain matter into jars. After all that was said and done, they cleaned up my remains like fallen hair in a barber shop and swiftly left the room. But how did I live? I'm not entirely sure. They stripped away every physical aspect of my being, but I was still there. A sort of bubble of floating consciousness. I could still see and hear, but I was without a material body. As jarring as that may sound, I was just happy to no longer be in pain. I didn't realize it, but Hank was still in the room. He walked over to me and leaned in real close, stopped watching Hank. See? Now that wasn't so hard, was it? And looky here, you've only got 18 minutes left. How will you spend it? What things will you see? Well, there's only one way to find out. Hank turned around and walked out the kitchen door, leaving me alone in the white room. Within an instant, things began to change around me. The walls, floor and ceiling faded, revealing an array of distant stars behind them. I somehow went from being in a diner on planet Earth to floating around in the vacuum of space within mere moments. 
Within seconds of the room completely fading from view, I was unwillingly hurled through the universe at light speed. Everything around me blurred, and my bodiless soul spun around uncontrollably. If I had a stomach, it would have been turning. I'll never forget what I went through in the coming moments, but I'll also never fully remember it either. I wish I could tell you exactly what I experienced, but being a floating orb of pure consciousness is like being in a dream. The details of what happened are very fuzzy. In truth, I can only tell you how it felt. That will never go away. As I traveled through deep space, I was stopped in specific locations, mostly foreign planets and dead star systems. When stopped, I saw unspeakable things, gruesome things, things I never knew could exist in the universe. I was plagued with disturbing sights and concepts of incomprehensible proportions. So horrific in fact, that it made what the shadowy figures had done to me look tame in comparison. I don't remember exactly what it was I saw out there, but I still feel an immense dread whenever I try to recall it. After what felt like an eternity of torture, I was eventually transported to what I can only assume was a location outside of the observable universe. There were no stars or any light to speak of, not even off in the distance. I was alone in a blanket of darkness, left to suffer with the memories of what I endured. Just as I was beginning to accept my circumstances, a light glow appeared in the distance. As it came closer to my position, I recognized its features. It was Hank's stopwatch. The readout was approaching zero. Ten. Nine. Eight. I started to feel weary, almost like I was falling into a deep sleep. Was that even possible in my current state? Seven, six, five. Like a projected movie, the past half hour of my life appeared on the black canvas of space behind the stopwatch. It played in reverse at a high speed, like a VHS stuck on rewind. Four, three, two. Feeling faint, I tried to focus on the pseudo projection. I relived everything that happened to me in the diner within just a few seconds. One, zero, and poof. Just like that, I was back in the diner parking lot, body and flesh intact. My car was there next to me, right where I parked it. I took out my phone and checked the time. It was 12.01. Everything had returned to normal somehow to the way it was before. Elated, I jumped into my car and started it up. I was about to drive off like a bat out of hell, but I decided to take one last look at the diner. Somehow, within its walls, there does exist an extra hour in the day. How that's possible and what its purpose is, I can't be certain. Maybe Hank was right, and option three had something to do with it. The only thing I do know is that I survived, and I won't be making another pit stop anytime soon, no matter how hungry I may be. Just then, before my very eyes, the diner lifted itself from its foundation and flew upwards into the night sky. <laughs> 